Mm. Uh -huh. well, we are ready to start the 30 se second countdown. Uh, 10 second verbal. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. our witnesses sooner and help members keep their schedule. Uh, therefore, I ask unanimous consent that all other members' opening statements be made part of the record if they're submitted to the clerk by 5 p.m. today or the close of the hearing, whichever comes first. And hearing no objection, that is so ordered. Without objection, the chair may also declare a recess subject to the call of the chair. As described in our notice, Statements, documents, or motions must be submitted to the electronic repository at this email address, hnrcdocs at mail.house.gov. Additionally, please note that as with our in-person meetings, uh, members who are joining us remotely are responsible for their own microphones, and uh, as with in-person meetings, they'll only be muted by staff if that's necessary to avoid inadvertent background noise. Pursuant to Committee Rule 3L, and the latest guidance from the attending physician, anyone present in the hearing room today must wear a mask covering their mouth and nose, regardless of vaccination status, except when you're speaking. Uh, it is my hope that with everyone's cooperation, we can protect the safety of members and staff and the families uh, that they will return to at home. The committee has masks available for any members who need them. Uh, finally, members or witnesses experiencing technical difficulties should allow, uh, inform committee staff right away so we can uh, help. I'll begin by recognizing myself uh, for a brief opening statement. It is nice to be here again in person with many of you. I'm grateful uh, to those who are also joining us virtually from afar. Uh, today, uh, our hearing is focused on the Magnuson-Stevens Fishery Conservation and Management Act. The reauthorization of that act is years in the making. We have two reauthorization bills before us today, mine, uh, and of course I've developed mine uh, working closely with Congressman Ed Case, and a bill from Congressman Don Young. <laughs> Yay, Don. Uh, we'll also be examining Congresswoman uh, Debbie Dingell's bill on forage fish conservation today. America is truly a leader in sustainable fisheries management, but the MSA hasn't been reauthorized in over a decade, and while it's an important bill that has stood the test of time, uh, it needs some updates, uh, particularly concerning the impacts of climate change. When I first started drafting uh, the bill that we've titled Sustaining America's Fisheries for the Future Act, uh, again in partnership with Congressman Case, I knew that we needed to change the narrative around marine fisheries. We wanted the conversation to not be about partisan politics, but to be an inclusive, transparent, and stakeholder-driven process so that we could get back to basics and focus on the needs of fishing communities. I'm a big believer that good process makes good policy. And so, uh, we started with a process of hearing directly from stakeholders all over the country. And we were able to do that in person uh, in many of our listening sessions. And then the pandemic intervened, uh, but we pushed through and finished the rest of those sessions uh, virtually. After that, we released a discussion draft of our bill and actively sought comments on it uh, from stakeholders all over the country. You know, I, th I think people are not only tired of the partisan divides they see with so many issues getting hij hijacked by partisan agendas, they're also tired of backroom deals. And so we really tried with this bill to open it up and make this one of the most transparent processes uh, anyone has ever seen for developing a major piece of legislation. From the listening sessions to taking comments, we have genuinely heard from stakeholders all over the board. 
uh, commercial, recreational, charter, tribal, subsistence fishers, environmentalists, scientists, council members, and other regulators, processors, the offshore wind industry, and more. We learned through this process that, again, while MSA uh, is a great law that is largely working, doesn't need to be reinvented, um, but it does need to be updated. And at the top of the list of updates is climate change. Fish stocks are shifting. Ecosystems are changing. How we manage fish needs to change as well. And that means incorporating more climate science, improving coordination, and more strategic planning. All of that is included in this bill. We also need to update some provisions relating to the eight regional fishery management councils. This bill includes language that strengthens the public process and transparency, including updates for council ethics requirements, more transparent voting, and strengthening anti-lobbying provisions. We also included two seats to the North Pacific Council for Alaska Natives, who historically have been far uh, too unrepresented. We created voting liaison seats for the New England and Mid-Atlantic Councils, where stocks are uh, overlapping and shifting due to climate change. This will help both regions plan for and adapt to climate change, and it'll help reduce conflict between the regions. This legislation also uh, is very heavy on science and data. This is one of the points of consensus that we heard all over the country from just about every stakeholder. Um, we need more data, better data, to keep up with today's fishery management challenges. We need the best available science. And so we've included language to expand and improve electronic technologies, cooperative research and management updates, and recreational fishing data consistency improvements. In Title V, we address many critical conservation issues that'll make MSA even more effective as the world's best example of sustainable fisheries management. My bill strengthens language intended to reduce bycatch, strengthens protections for essential fish habitat, and amends requirements for fishery rebuilding plan outcomes so that we don't end up on uh, endless rebuilding plan loops. We need to ensure that rebuilding plans are working so that we can have productive and sustainable fisheries. We also include uh, Congresswoman Debbie Dingell's bill on forage fish conservation in our Magnuson reauthorization bill. This will help us manage a foundational, uh, a set of foundational species as a food source for other fish and animals in our marine ecosystem. And finally, we incorporated several other bipartisan bills in the legislation. Some go beyond the MSA, but they're critical for fishing communities and fisheries management. Uh, Representative Pingree's Working Waterfronts Act, Representative Webster's and my Fishery Disaster Improvement Act, uh, for example. I want to thank the Dean of the House, Congressman Don Young, for his decades of leadership on marine fisheries management and for the productive conversations that we've had so far uh, on this subject. Of course, he played an instrumental role in the original writing of the MSA. It really should bear his name on it. And while our two bills at this point uh, have some differences, there's also much that we agree on. So I am going to continue reaching out to my friend, Congressman Young, and to his team in hopes that we can come together on a bipartisan bill as the process moves forward. And with that, I will turn it over to Representative Young, who is standing in, I think, very appropriately as ranking member uh, for this hearing for his opening remarks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for the comments that you made about my role in this bill. Uh, I like to say I wrote the bill with a lot of good staff help. Me and Gary Studs, he was the chairman, and um, we solved a problem we were faced with at that time of foreign fishing fleets invading our waters all the way up to 12 miles off our shores. Uh, it was a hard fought battle, hard to get everybody together. We did it, uh, and then it was sent over to the Senate side, and the Senate got a hold of it with Mr. Senator Magnus and Senator Stevens, took our bill and put their name on it and sent it back to us. So it became a Senate bill. It should have been the Young Studs bill, but uh, I'd like to say that. Anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, we, 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 I, I will somewhat agree with what you said. We, we have a working relationship. I think we can solve this problem. This bill has worked well, though. And I don't want us to do something that keeps it from working. Uh, I know you have a vision in it that I'm supportive of, and some people are not as supportive of. There's two um, Alaska Natives on the council. That'll be opposed by some people in the lower 48, as you well know. Uh, but I do think they play a major role and should be involved in it, and it would be in my bill if I was passing. But the big thing, it doesn't do any good to get on the board or the council if they don't have the authority. And I do believe your bill passes that authority, most of it, back to the secretary. And that's the one person's position 
It's a political appointee, and I don't think it's safe. I like the council system. If they have failed, show this, and let's see if we can improve upon it. Uh, you, transparency is good, uh, ethics is good, I agree with all those things. But you can't have a shadow council if they don't have some authority. And our North Pacific Council has worked well. It's not the best, but it's probably the best of all the councils. But it's done the job for the industry and for, remember, the original intent was sustainable yield of a species. The conservation, not preservation, conservation of species sustainable for the communities and for the food sources for America and other countries too. I, I do believe that it's worked well. Can we improve upon it? Yes. And I'm willing to sit down and work with you and see if we can do this. I look forward to hearing my witnesses on what they have to present. And when that's done, uh, let's work a bill, like you say, bipartisanly and try to get to the situation where it needs improvement, improve it. But don't destroy what has worked well in the past. Because we have, I think, a great example uh, that can make sure that we have the original intent sustainable yield of a species of fish, whatever they are, for the future generations of America. With that, I yield back the balance. All right. I uh, thank, thank the ranking member. I understand that the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Westerman, has an opening statement as well, so we'll yield to him. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for holding this hearing on reauthorizing the Magnuson-Stevenson, or Magnuson-Stevens Act which is one of the most important laws under this committee's jurisdiction. Uh, we know it may be named after two former senators, but anyone in the fisheries world knows that our Dean of the House, Don Young, is co-responsible for not only its creation in 1976, uh, but for its continuation. It's only fitting that he is the acting subcommittee ranking member for this hearing. He is the true expert in this field, and we are honored to have him here captaining the boat on our side of the aisle. The MSA law as uh, we are looking at today has been reauthorized twice with the possibility for a third time. As Mr. Young referenced, our laws are not written in stone and it's our duty to review them as needed. That involves looking at what has worked and what hasn't, which is the scope of this hearing. We will hear today that this landmark fisheries law has helped create world-class opportunities for commercial and recreational anglers alike. Jobs in our coastal areas and even landlocked communities in Arkansas where boat construction flourishes, thanks in part to recreational fishing in salt water, are the direct result of federal fisheries law. And in many cases, the seafood we enjoy on our dinner plates comes from American waters managed under the law before us. From some of the witness testimonies here today, it is evident that one of the reasons the law has been successful is that the MSA law empowered regional management that accounted for difference in fisheries, communities, dialogues, history, and the like. The regional councils are given national standards to adhere to, but have the ability to meet those standards using regional approaches. Mr. Young's bill continues that management style while providing for more flexibility and transparency in the law. Mr. Young's bill also promotes science. We will hear today that researchers are making great technological advances to measure fish abundance and that the federal government, at least involving red snapper in the Gulf of Mexico, has some work to do when it comes to fish counting. On the other hand, we will hear that Mr. Huffman's reauthorization bill um, goes a little bit in the opposite direction and I hope we can work together to come up with a, a bill that recognizes these advances in science. And instead of empowering councils, uh, I don't think we need a bill that restricts them and gives more power to the federal bureaucracy in Washington, D.C. It could lead to regulatory chaos and litigation when it comes to changes on federal bycatch standards. The bill also changes the process for potential impacts on essential fish habitats and gives NOAA uh, superpower status over other federal agencies. For example, the U.S. Navy has strong concerns over these provisions and is worried about military preparedness and readiness. In addition, given President Biden's current supply chain crisis, enacting provisions which inhibit dredging or port development will make this situation even worse. In conclusion, both bills, as well as Congresswoman Dingell's bill on forage fisheries, which is included in Mr. Huffman's bill, are well-intentioned. 
but we need to ensure that wh whatever this committee does after this hearing does not undermine what has worked for fishing communities. I again commend Mr. Young for his true leadership on this effort, and I look forward to today's testimony. I yield back. I thank the ranking member. Uh, as this is a uh, legislative hearing, our first panel is uh, one of congressional members speaking about the bills on the agenda. Uh, Congress, Congressman Young and I have already given our opening statements where we addressed our legislation. So we will now hear from Representative Dingell for her statement on her bill, H.R. 5770, the Forage Fish Conservation Act of 2021. Representative Dingell, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Huffman, and to my dear friend, Representative Young, who uh, has done so much work in all of this area. I'm always honored to work with him. And thank you for convening today's hearing to discuss legislation to strengthen our nation's fisheries. I appreciate the committee's inclusion of the Forage Fish Conservation Act, which is bipartisan legislation. I'm leading with my colleague, Congressman Brian Mast. Forage fish, the smaller fish that support other recreationally and commercially important species, such as tuna, salmon, cod, are vital for sustaining a healthy marine ecosystem. However, the numbers of many of these fishes have declined dramatically in recent years and are at historic lows. For example, coastwide landings of shad and river herring have fallen by more than 96% since 1950. And additionally, human demand for these human species has continued to grow. These increased pressures, if not addressed soon, will threaten opportunities for recreational fishermen as well as the larger marine ecosystem. To maintain healthy and abundant fisheries in the coming years, we must work to strengthen science-based mechanisms for fisheries management that build upon the success of the Magnuson-Stevens and other proven conservation measures. And that's why the Forage Fish Conservation Act is necessary. This legislation gives the Secretary of Commerce the authority to create a science-based definition for forage fish in federal waters and ensures that scientific advice sought by fishery managers includes recommendations for forage fish, all while preserving state management of forage fish fisheries that occur in their jurisdiction. Additionally, the legislation assesses the impact of any new commercial forage fish fishery could have on existing fisheries, fishing communities, and the marine ecosystem prior to the fishery being authorized. Taken together, the provisions in the Forage Fish Conservation Act would implement a consistent fisheries conservation policy throughout the eight fisheries management councils. This will allow Americans to enjoy healthier ecosystems that support thriving coastal communities, as well as their associated economies. This legislation has broad bipartisan support, as well as the backing of groups, including the American Sports Fishing Association, the National Marine Manufacturers Association, the National Wildlife Federation, the Pew Charitable Trust, and the Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership. I would also like to ask unanimous consent to enter into the record a letter signed by dozens of scientists from across the country supporting the fish Forage Fish Conservation Act. The need for action is clear, as is the cost of inaction. By acting now, building upon the excess of Magnus and Stevens, proven state-based conservation mechanisms, we will be able to address the pressing need for the benefit of fishing communities and the economy at large. I wanna thank my colleague, Brian Mast, for his leadership and his support of this legislation and look forward to continuing to work in, I hope, a very bipartisan manner to move the Forage Fish Conservation Act forward. I urge my colleagues to support this legislation and I yield back. Thank you, Representative Dingell, for joining us to testify today. We'll now transition to our second panel and hear testimony from the administration and government witnesses I'll remind non-administration witnesses that they're encouraged to participate in the Witness Diversity Survey that was created by the Congressional Office of Diversity and Inclusion. Witnesses may refer to the hearing invitation materials for further information on that. Under our committee rules, uh, we ask witnesses to limit oral statements to five minutes. 
Uh, of course, your entire statement will appear in the hearing record. When you begin speaking, the timer begins counting down. It turns orange when you have one minute left. And uh, I recommend that members and witnesses joining us remotely use the grid view in WebEx so that you can lock the timer on your screen. Uh, when your testimony is complete, please do remember to mute yourself to avoid inadvertent background noise. And uh, I'll allow all the witnesses to testify before we bring it back to members for questions. Our first witness is Ms. Janet Coit, Assistant Administrator of the National Marine Fisheries Service, Acting Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Oceans and Atmosphere and Deputy NOAA Administrator. Uh, after that, we will hear from Mr. Mark Gorelnik, Chair of the Council Coordination Committee and Chair of the Pacific Fisheries Management Council. The Chair now recognizes Ms. Coit for five minutes. Welcome. Chairman Huffman, Ranking Members Young and Bents, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Janet Coit. I'm the Assistant Administrator for Fisheries at NOAA. The Magnuson-Stevens Fishery Conservation and Management Act is the legal foundation for the world's most sustainable fisheries. Since its passage in 1976, we've made great strides in recovering fisheries and supporting the U.S. seafood and recreational fishing sectors. The progress we've made is built on strong science, collaboration with tribes, states, and the fisheries commissions, the diligent work of the regional councils, and the support of NOAA's dedicated employees. On behalf of NOAA, I want to thank Chairman Huffman, Representative Case, and Ranking Member Young um, for your work on these bills. As you mentioned, they're a result of significant input and present thoughtful approaches to our fishery management challenges. From the productive waters of our oceans to the millions of jobs associated with our commercial and recreational industries, there is a lot at stake. I hope we all agree that the dynamic science-based process under Magnuson provides the nation with a successful fisheries management construct. Guided by the Act's unique participatory process, we have almost ended overfishing in the United States. In fact, we've rebuilt close to 50 domestic fish stocks since 2000. Still, we confront many challenges, and we're eager to work with you to identify opportunities to improve. Climate change is impacting our coastal and ocean ecosystems, and we need to move quickly to better prepare for and respond to these changes. We appreciate the overarching climate focus of H.R. 4690. The bill's proposed requirements to assess the vulnerability of fish stocks to climate change build upon the administration's efforts to deliver science and information to help managers respond. Our experts are working on climate-ready strategies to help fisheries managers adapt to changing conditions in the North Pacific and other geographies. We support the proposed change of the term overfished to depleted, acknowledging that population size and status can be influenced by many factors in addition to fishing. H.R. 4690 recognizes the growing need for cross-council coordination as stocks shift due to climate change. We're already taking concrete steps to address those issues, such as hosting scenario planning workshops to address priority management and governance issues related to climate change. H.R. 4690 addresses the importance of using technology to improve and expand fisheries data collection via electronic monitoring. NOAA has implemented seven electronic monitoring programs and has over 6,000 vessels using electronic logbooks. We'll continue to press forward with EM and new technologies. Habitat is the foundation upon which productive fisheries are built. The Huffman Case Bill recognizes the important role essential fish habitat plays in the success of our fisheries, and we'd like to work with you to continue to strengthen these protections. The bill also recognizes the challenges of conducting stock assessments and fisheries surveys amidst the growing demand for offshore wind. There are several provisions in the bills that benefit fishing communities as they work to provide healthy seafood to our nation. Both bills would replace the default 10-year rebuilding timeline, which provides a more scientifically sound approach for rebuilding. Additionally, 4690 expands opportunities to collaborate on seafood marketing as we build back after the pandemic. Several provisions are in line with the President's recent executive order on equity and environmental justice, including the addition of two seats to represent Alaskan tribes on the North Pacific Council. These provisions, together with a new subsistence fishing definition in both bills, promote the participation of important and diverse fishing communities in decision making. Ensuring employees, including council employees, are free from sexual assault and sexual harassment is a real priority for me. Uh, NOAA supports the bill's expansion of SASH policies. In regard to fishery disasters, I am fully committed to doing a better job at turning around funding 
we support the intent of these bills to speed up that process. Uh, shifting gears, I'd like to note some concerns about provisions in both bills. Uh, for example, the expanded scope of some of the requirements could redirect limited funding and staff away from core activities. We're also concerned about the numerous additional reports and some of the process requirements that might further strain the workload for the council and the um, NOAA staff. My written testimony provides further details regarding provisions that present challenges and implementation concerns. But I want to leave you with this. I am committed to working with you to promoting the economic viability of our fishing sectors and our coastal communities while ensuring that our fish docks and marine habitats are healthy and resilient for years to come. And we need to do more to address climate change. And I look forward to working you, with you to tackle that challenge and other challenges ahead. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Coit. The chair now recognizes Mr. Gorelnik to testify for five minutes. Chairman Huffman and Ranking Member Young, my name is Mark Gorelnik. While I am chair of the Pacific Fishery Management Council today, I will testify on behalf of the Council Coordination Committee. The CCC is made up of the leadership of the eight regional fishery management councils. Let me start by saying that the MSA works. The act requires that fisheries management be science-based, be conducted in a transparent manner, and include all stakeholders at the table. The Secretary of Commerce ensures the decisions comply with all laws before implementation. While this is time consuming, it ensures that decisions are fully transparent and science based. Our success is clear. Commercial, recreational, and subsistence fisheries are key contributors to our coastal communities, including disadvantaged communities and the nation's economy. This is because the Act structured a very successful regional approach to sustainable fisheries management. And the councils are its keystone. These domestic fisheries provide healthy, sustainable protein for the entire nation, recreational opportunities for millions of Americans, and cultural benefits to subsistence fishermen. It's worth noting where the two authorization bills agree. Both identify the need for more and better science, better data collection, in particular for data poor stocks and recreational fisheries. Transparency in decision making and increased recognition of subsistence fishing, council coordination for shifting or transboundary stocks, cooperative research, and the potential benefits of electronic monitoring. The councils are already addressing many of these issues raised in the bills. Our regional approach to management means legislation can affect each council differently. This is reflected in our individual feedback letters on HR 4690. My remarks will briefly summarize our shared concerns. Both bills emphasize the importance of adequate data and stock assessments. This emphasis on improving the science will help us adapt to the changing environment. We note, however, that many regions lack the basic data needed to meet current requirements, let alone new mandates. Directives to include new items in FMPs may be impossible to address, particularly if data do not exist to support the requirements or they are not adequately funded. We share an interest in a transparent, ethical council system. Council members and staff are already subject to rules of conduct published by NIMS. However, it is unclear how these new provisions will be enforced and what their impacts would be. We agree that clarifying prohibitions against sexual harassment apply to council, committee, and advisory panel members will help make for a more welcoming environment, but it will also create a need for periodic training. My written testimony touches on a number of key issues in all three bills. Let me highlight just a few from HR 4690. The ability of councils to successfully manage fisheries in the face of climate change will require the ability to adapt to changing species distributions and productivity. However, many regions currently lack the baseline of fish and habitat surveys necessary to understand and quantify changes clearly attributable to climate change. This lack of basic data will make it more difficult to comply with new legislative requirements. Current law requires councils to minimize adverse effects of fishing on habitat and to minimize bycatch to the extent practicable. HR 4690 would remove the practicability standard. This phrase provides councils the ability to develop measures that take into account all of the national standards and the removal of this qualifier will lead to increased litigation. Prohibiting councils from contacting the administration on presidential actions will limit the ability of the councils to provide their expertise developed over decades. The requirement to document, document all communications with federal or state officials on subjects other than routine fishery management creates a tremendous 
administrative burden and will jeopardize our attorney-client relationship with NOAA General Counsel. We know of no other organizations subject to such requirements. Finally, forage fish are clearly important to ecosystem-based fishery management, and most, if not all, councils have already taken measures to conserve forage fish. However, regional differences in fisheries make it difficult to define forage fish with a one-size-fits-all description or criteria. I want to acknowledge the supportive relationship between the councils and the National Marine Fishery Service. The service is a key participant in the council process and a key provider of the information we need. The regional offices and science centers are critical to our process, but they will also be challenged to meet the additional legislative requirements. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to present the views of the Council Coordination Committee, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Grelnick. We'll now bring it back to the members for questions. Uh, I'll begin by recognizing uh, Congressman Ed Case of Hawaii, who's just been a great partner in developing this legislation. Uh, Mr. Case, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I, I want to start off by associating myself fully with your remarks as well as Mr. Young's and Mr. Westerman's at the outset. Um, the process of uh, evaluating Magnuson-Stevens and of developing this draft is one of the best I've ever seen. I think that it's one of the principal reasons why we are uh, very cordially uh, talking about uh, uh, issues that um, in other uh, circumstances would be more difficult, and I'm sure we're going to work this all out in, with the participation of of everybody involved, so thank you for that. Um, Ms. Coit, thank you for your testimony. T thank you for your testimony, and um, first of all, Ms. Coit, um, just a few days ago, uh, the Department of Commerce Inspector General's Office uh, on, December, on November 10th released a report uh, relating to the um, administration of the Western Pacific Regional Management Council's uh, governance of the Western Pacific Sustainable Fisheries Fund and uh, Mr. Chair, I would ask a unanimous consent that, that that report be entered into the record. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Also, uh, Honolulu, Honolulu Civil Beat, a media um, outlet in my home state of Hawaii, has uh, published a very extensive series and is still in the process of publishing a series relating to the Western Pacific uh, Fisheries Management Council. The first article was November 3rd, and it continues, and I'd like that uh, also, if I could, ask unanimous consent to enter that into the record. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ms. Coit, have you read the audit report? Yes, sir. Okay, and um, first of all, the audit report uh, essentially said in so many words uh, that of the money uh, administered uh, by the Western Pacific Fishery Management Council in the uh, Sustainable Fisheries Fund for Westpac, uh, the, part of the, uh, the part of the oceans that, that I come from, um, had been um, inadequate um, or worse. Um, and uh, fundamentally, uh, the funds that have been spent, which are federal funds and overseed by the, overseen by the federal government, um, of the total amount of funds dating back to two, 2008, uh, they could not evaluate uh, the funds uh, for years uh, 08 to 15, as I recall, because the records for those funds were no longer required and had, in fact, been disposed of. But of the funds uh, expended since uh, 2015 to date, Roughly 40% plus uh, were questionable in some way, shape, or form. And so my, my big picture question, and it relates directly to this legislation because we are, we are certainly trying to uh, clean up and uh, provide greater oversight, is what, what is the department doing about that audit report right now? So, uh, so NOAA is um, con committed to continuous improvement and the audit report as you mentioned, uncovered um, deficiencies, which are deeply concerning to me. Uh, yesterday, I met with Jeff Thomas, who's the head of NOAA's Acquisition and Grants Office, AGO, who is responsible for uh, implementing the recommendations and overseeing the grants at NOAA. So we talked about um, our concerns in regard to the questionable uh, $1.2 million that was identified and various mechanisms from training to additional oversight um, to um, some other ideas that he had for pre-approvals that would be implemented as part of following through. So I can assure you um, that I share your concerns uh, that NOAA will follow through on the recommendations and that um, you, know, you expect an audit to uncover some deficiencies, but the extent and the percentage of grants that were deemed questionable 
for poor record keeping or other um, issues identified was certainly um, yeah, out I mean, of line and concerning. With respect, and I appreciate your saying that because uh, some have downplayed these audit results and said they were, you know, episodal. There was nothing, no big deal. Um, just one or two, this or that's about them. Um, and when you get forty percent plus over a period of time, to me, that is emblematic of one of two things, maybe both. Uh, number one, a failure to actually administer, administer the funds in compliance with federal law, and number two, a failure of oversight. And so this is not just about Westpac, this is also about NOAA's oversight. And I would ask you this question, uh, do you feel that you have the statutory authority uh, to uh, sufficiently oversee uh, Westpac and its expenditure of these funds? Because this is our opportunity to tighten up um, your oversight if you feel that there's somehow something lacking in your oversight uh, authorizations. As I mentioned, it's the NOAA Grants Division that is overseeing uh, the grants that are given to the councils and has responsibility for following through on these recommendations. I would want to talk to them about whether that authority is sufficient. I, I will tell you this, I want to do more trainings with all the councils um, because uh, that audit report which you called for, uh, four of you, raised concerns. We know that people are obligated to follow the rules, but whether they're following the rules you know, requires more oversight. Um, but I'd like to get back to you on that in terms of the authority. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank the gentleman. Uh, the Chair recognizes Ranking Member Westerman for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Mr. Gorelnik, uh, you are representing the regional councils today, and the regional councils are the ones who would be responsible for implementing the bills before us. Uh, if they're enacted. So it's very important to hear your perspective. Uh, it seems to me that one of the reasons the Magnuson-Stevens Act has been so effective is that the regions have flexibility in meeting outcomes. And as we all know, uh, regions have differences, so it's important for solutions to be resolved in the regions and not by Washington, D.C. Your testimony indicates that there are some concerns that the councils may have uh, with Mr. Huffman's bill, and namely that it decreases the regional flexibility. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Representative Westerman, thank you very much. I'll, I'll, I'll try. I, I think it's important from the perspective of the councils that uh, the guidance in uh, be provided in terms of outcomes as opposed to uh, detailed um, descriptions of methods because fisheries are different, communities are different. That's why we have eight regional fishery management organizations and, and not one. And that's why uh, the, the, uh, the act provides for these, for regional uh, management uh, of, of, the, of these stocks and, and the impacts of the stocks. Um, I, I think that for example, uh, and there's more details in my written testimony, uh, the deletion of the word practicable uh, would is, is of particular concern uh, because um, it, it would really eliminate the uh, balancing that the national standard guidelines permit uh, the councils to to utilize. Uh, there are other aspects of of, of the litigate of the uh, legislation that are concerning, uh, having to do with timelines. Uh, to enact fishery management plan changes and others where there, there's the, the, whether it be a 90 day deadline or a six month deadline or whatever the deadlines are in the legislation, it's, they're, they're not, uh, they're not practical <laughs> for, 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 uh, for uh, our organizations that meet a handful of times a year and sometimes with several months, typically several months between meetings. And, you know, these changes often require a two or three meeting process, uh, not to mention the work that goes uh, into these changes ahead of time. So I, I, I think there are some valuable things uh, in Representative Huffman's legislation, uh, but I think that uh, certain aspects of the process that are used now by the councils are working very well and they don't need to be disturbed. Yeah, I think one of the things and you alluded to it uh, was the 180-day uh, requirement on um, fishery management plans or amendments, and I, I believe you said it takes as much as two years to do one of those now, but are you, are you saying the process works now and has been successful and there's no reason to, to change that, or would there be room for uh, maybe shortening it a little bit? Well, you know, I, 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 you know, I only have practical experience with my own council, and I think that we 
uh, work in, in the Pacific Council with all due deliberation, uh, taking into account the need to provide adequate uh, time for public input and, and discussion. Um, I, you know, and I, I think we do things as rapidly as we can, given the, the science that's available uh, and given the need uh, for community input. Um, I, I, you know, if there are going to be time constraints, they, they certainly need to be uh, not as tight as these. They're just, they're just uh, pretty realistic. Well, uh, appreciate your testimony. And you know, we've talked about Alaska, we've talked about the Gulf, but I want to yield my, the remaining time to uh, Mr. Whitman, who also has uh, important fisheries in his district. Well, thank you, Ranking Member. I appreciate, uh, appreciate your leadership. And uh, um, Ms. Cohen, let me, let me go to you. I want you, I want you to expand a little bit on the change in wording in, uh, in Mr. Huffman's bill that gets to the elimination of, to the current extent, practical. And that is a term used in the legislation to specifically account for differences between regions, between catch methods, to make sure that we're assessing things like bycatch, that it's something that is achievable. We all know there's different types of gear. I worked as a commercial fisherman for years. My son has been a commercial fisherman for 17 years. I can tell you how incredibly different things are, gear changes, all those things. When you remove that term to the extent practicable, then you allow no flexibility. You allow no consideration for gear changes, for what happens in the real world. So give me, give me your perspective on what you think that means for the law and for fishermen, both recreational and commercial, with the removal of that language in Mr. Huffman's bill. As Mr. Gorelnik said, the regional differences are uh, dramatic in some instances, and the changes related to climate change are dramatic in many instances. Uh, so I think the opportunity for councils uh, to balance interests and to use um, their judgment has been one of the reasons that this statute has been successful. Uh, so I think there's both the desire to reduce bycatch, which is something I share, and I think there isn't a fisherman I know that wants, doesn't want to reduce discards, um, and then and an intention to, re to increase uh, pressure to reduce bycatch, and we've made tremendous strides over the last few years, um, but the, there is um, a lot of uh, history around to the extent practicable, yeah. and I think um, many of the industry folks who have concerns about removing that have them uh, for good reasons as we balance uh, different interests. So um, I'll, I guess I'll stop there. Very good. Thank and you. Thank you, yeah, the I time, time has expired. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, the chair now recognizes Mr. Soto for five minutes. Thank you so much, Chairman. I have the honor of representing Florida Florida's 9th Congressional District, and uh, fishing is really a way of life. Uh, iconic fish like red snapper, grouper, mahi-mahi are really uh, not only uh, key, also billfish, sailfish. Um, they're what's for dinner and for lunch, uh, as well as a key part of recreation in our state. Uh, and we see two visions here, uh, and I applaud the chair for putting them both up. And uh, there's definitely room for compromise among them. Uh, my key priority and the key priority for Florida is sustainability, a balance between fish stocks that are healthy, recreation, and commercial fishing. Uh, so it'd be great to first hear from Administrator Coit on sort of your vision, the, the pluses and minuses of both HR 59 and 4690 in, in light of the goals that I just mentioned. That's a broad question. I'll try to do it justice. You got plenty of uh, time. First, there, uh, there's several provisions that are in both of the bills. Um, and I think those things like changing the 10-year uh, rebuilding uh, time frame, including a definition of subsistence fishing, are really positive and in both bills. One of the things you mentioned that is in the Huffman case bill that I think is really important is just changing overfish to depleted. Because when you look at sustainability and it's not just overfishing. It's not just what you take um, that is relevant to 
biomass and stock status. There are a whole lot of other conditions. Um, and in states like Florida, I know um, you've had many concerns about harmful algal blooms. Um, obviously, there's warming waters that's affected us quite a bit up in Rhode Island. So I think looking at the totality of the ecosystem, which is the direction that the Huffman Bill is going in, and looking at the multiple variables that could affect the health of, of fish, and, and asking us to look at vulnerabilities related to climate change and to take those into account when we're um, setting quotas. Because under Magnuson, you have really one lever, but there's a lot of other things that are going on in the ocean. So the Huffman case bill is a much longer bill. It addresses many other uh, issues from seafood marketing to coastal communities. Um, so they're, they're hard to compare. Uh, and um, there's things in both bills that, that, I, that we like and um, things in both bills that we have some concerns in regard to the implementation. What are the concerns with regard to implementation? Um, for, for one thing, and, and I mentioned this in my opening statement, um, for instance, there's maybe uh, more than 20 additional reports. We'd like to, we've had some great dialogue already with the staff, and like to keep that up. So we'd like to look at mechanisms for informing you of what you need to know, or what you wanna know, um, without, uh, with, without having so many more new requirements. Um, well, Administrator Coit, I know this committee has an aversion to more bureaucracy, so you may have some allies there in that. <laughs> uh, you mentioned, uh, uh, algal blooms and, and uh, red tide is a, another aspect and all that. Uh, uh, so how important is it for us to make sure we don't have withdrawals of nutrients, or in this case, uh, an old phosphate stack that basically the dam broke and nutrients uh, exploded into the, into the Gulf? How, how critical are, are those inter inland threats to our fish stocks also? So I'm not expert on or, or familiar enough to talk about that specific example, um, but certainly the additional nutrients combined with warmer waters have created more harmful algal blooms in many areas, um, low dissolved oxygen and more fish kills. So it's of great concern in terms of the health of our um, marine species. Sure, and lastly, and, and I agree, and, uh, and it's while red tide is naturally occurring, when nutrients hit it, it explodes. Um, and then uh, I'm really concerned about making sure there's enough bandwidth here for recreational fishing. It sometimes seems like we see a huge amount of commercial fishing, but recreational fishing, which is key for our quality of life in Florida and for tourism, uh, gets left out. How important is it for these bills to protect recreational fishing? So recreational fishing is, of course, um, a huge part of the economy in the Florida and in the Gulf um, and, and really in all coastal states. So I think the critically important to also protect the sustainability um, and the opportunity for recreational fishing in America. And um, I was happened to be able to go to ICAST in Orlando um, this summer, which was a wonderful event, um, and was actually with Mark Gorelnik there. But you know, the amount of economic activity around recreational fishing is just um, is so important and growing. Um, so yes, this, this statute is intended to ensure sustainability and, and promote recreational fishing as well. Uh, thanks, Administrator Coit, and I appreciate you supporting Central Florida Tourism. <laughs> the Chair uh, recognizes Mr. Young for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Coit, um, do you believe that the MSA has been the envy of the world as far as managing fish or any area you know it does a better job than we do? So first, let me also acknowledge your seminal role in the original act, um, and I'm sure you're proud of it. Yes, I think it is the, uh, I don't know, the envy of the world, um, but I think it's known far and wide as being um, responsible for the sustainable management and the rebuilding of fish stocks in the U.S. All right, the other second thing is the, the what concerns me, it's actually happened, happened under the original act, and I'm worried about the one that Mr. Huffman is proposing that under 4690, um, the additional lawsuits. NOAA had 100 lawsuits recently by mischievous lawyers. Oh, they're the worst. Yeah, and uh, I, I want to write it. Whatever we do, we have to write it somehow. We get the job done for sustainable yield of the species for the benefit of the communities also along that line because they're sustainable. But lawsuits don't do anything but spend money. 
Is there any way we can write these things so that they don't additionally add lawyers to lawsuits? Are you a lawyer? I am a lawyer. Oh, boy, God. Oh, <laughs> Jesus. I lost that battle real quick. But I, you follow what I'm saying. What happens... I object. And then this interest group can sue, and then it hurts the original intent of the act. So those of you on the dais know uh, more about how the statutes you enact result in lawsuits um, that challenge them or that further define their provisions uh, than I do, I'm sure. Um, I won't disagree with you that a lot of money is spent on litigation um, that I wish we could be putting towards uh, conservation and research and sustainability, uh, but I don't think there's a way to prevent that under our system. Is, well, <laughs> I could add, Mr. Chairman, that there is a way, because a lot of times these lawsuits are filed. Uh, the settlement's made by an agency. The money goes to those people not to benefit the resource which we're trying to protect. We ought to be able to fix that. The one thing, Mr. Chairman and, and, and Ms. Coy, I, I, I will tell you, I've heard you mention, Chairman, climate change. Uh, I, I advise everybody, yes, climate is changing. But there is no magic switch that turns the light on and off. And you have the human factor involved in this fisheries, in the community. And people that are sitting here have never caught a fish in their life. Now, they've been eating this nice little chum salmon out of the Cusquim River given by Miss Patola. I hope you enjoyed it. But we have to take that into consideration. We have to understand that this sounds good, looks good, but we also have the human factor and the effect upon them. And I hope we do this, we do this bill. I know you're high on the climate change. Okay. I will admit it. The first time I've admitted it to anybody but you. Mm. Uh, but... I'm not confident that we are not taking into consideration of other factors. And if we do anything in this bill about climate change, that has to be considered. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I, uh, I thank the ranking member. And uh, I'll now recognize myself. Uh, are, do we have votes pending at this point? Yeah, we have to, um, you started. can keep going. You can keep going until three. So we're going to go a little further, and then we're going to recess. And I apologize to everyone. This could be a fairly long vote series. Uh, but we will come back and uh, finish up. And I apologize in advance for the inconvenience. But uh, Ms. Coit, let me thank you. Let me also thank Mr. Gorelnik. Uh, the comments and feedback that we've gotten from NIMPS and from the Council Coordination Committee uh, are valuable. Uh, this legislation remains uh, a work in progress. We're going to keep trying to improve it. Uh, and even the discussion that we're hearing about um, this language to the extent practicable. I understand the concerns that some have expressed on, on uh, removing that qualifier from the bycatch provision, but I also note that all the words matter, and um, the, the law doesn't say there can be no bycatch. It says minimize bycatch. So there's already uh, a fairly broad term that makes it clear that we're not gonna end bycatch. That's, there's not gonna be a moratorium on entire fisheries if you find bycatch. So the real question is, um, what do you do uh, about how that additional qualifier, uh, to the extent practicable, that's fairly open-ended, um, has allowed bycatch to continue in some cases it, it's in some pretty disturbing ways. And I was discussing offline with uh, ranking member Young, how in, in some places the North Pacific, bycatch is not getting better, it's getting worse to the point where subsistence fishers and smaller uh, fishers are being pushed out of their own fisheries because of bycatch from an industry that's not even targeting salmon, halibut, crab in some cases. So let me ask you, uh, Ms. Coit, um, if you agree with what I just said, that you know whatever concerns there may be about taking away to the extent practicable uh, there probably ought to be a lot of concern about the trend that we have in some fisheries of bycatch not getting better. I think the short answer is I agree with what you said. Okay, I, I appreciate that. Let, let's talk about climate. Uh, obviously, one of the biggest uh, significant proposals in uh, the legislation Mr. Case and I are proposing is uh, climate change in fisheries management. And uh, one of the concerns that the councils have expressed, uh, it's not that we don't need to do this. Uh, understandably, they're concerned about workload. Uh, and so I wanna ask if there are ways in which NIMPS could ste step up and relieve some of the management burden from helping councils uh, incorporate 
climate into uh, the management of marine fisheries? So I'm not sure if we can relieve the management burden so much as I think our duty is to provide better information. Um, the president's budget asked for $70 million for additional funding. The stock surveys and the assessments, they're the backbone of fisheries management. And I have confidence in the councils. They're already, um, the, the Pacific Council, as you know, has already finished some scenario planning. Um, the North Pacific has been taking on some really difficult issues and using a precautionary principle. On the Atlantic, there's scenario planning to look at governance and management op options. Um, so I feel that what we need to do at NIMS is provide more and better data and science so we can understand better the changes in the ecosystem and that the councils have information in order to, to take an ecosystem-based approach and have not only some information about what's happening now, but some predictive information so that their management and the investments that the industry makes um, can be sure to be sustainable. Appreciate that. I, I believe later we're gonna hear some testimony suggesting that we shouldn't use stock assessments anymore because they use catch data. And uh, I know that uh, is a fairly provocative proposal that causes some concerns. Uh, let me ask you, how would we manage fisheries without including how much we're catching in our assessment of the health of those fisheries? From my perspective and the perspective of NOAA, we, we have to include the catch data. That's part of the full picture. And in some data poor places, it's, it's, it may be um, the primary data point that we have. Okay. So it's part of the totality. We were uh, talking just a moment ago about bycatch. So just to follow up on that a little bit more, um, this is not just an issue uh, of conserving marine life. Uh, there are heavy impacts on subsistence fishers who rely on species that are often not targeted by commercial fishermen, but end up being killed in huge numbers in some cases anyway. So could you explain a little bit um, how that is occurring and tell us how reducing bycatch is actually an environmental uh, justice issue? You mentioned um, when you were talking about bycatch earlier, uh, things like salmon and halibut in um, Alaska. So, and again, I think these are exacerbated by climate change and that doesn't mean we're leaving the human dimension out, it's just the way it is. So when you see the overall abundance of a fish like halibut go down, despite the fact that we've reduced bycatch quite a bit in, in the commercial fishing industry, um, you've put a further strain on the um, overall stock and that therefore reduces what's available for the indigenous people who are depending on halibut or depending on salmon. So I think the use conflicts are exacerbated when the stocks are um, stressed due to climate change or their abundance is going down and that creates a real um, equity issue. Appreciate that. My time has expired, but I will ask unanimous consent to enter into the record a memorandum from Accountable US that shows that Pollock trawlers, including Trident are far exceeding their bycatch limits of salmon and halibut, leaving small fishers in Alaska native fishing communities struggling to catch fish uh, without objection. That is entered into the record and it is now uh, unfortunately time where we have to go to the floor to vote. So we will recess uh, subject to a uh, call of the chair and we'll get back as soon as we can. Uh, yeah, so this panel is uh, thanked and relieved and uh, we'll get back to the next. Oh, we have more member questions. I am so sorry. All right, we are going to uh, continue with this panel, uh, and uh, we'll do that as quickly as we can.
of all, even if you had information, you might not have it anymore, right? Because your house was.
Mr. Chair, if you're ready. It's ridiculous. One, uh, thanks so much for your patience. Uh, the committee is now back in session and we will resume questioning of uh, the second panel. Uh, recognize Congresswoman uh, Gonzalez Colon for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you to the witnesses that are here and the ones that are uh, online. Uh, I want to say that in Puerto Rico, uh, most of our fisheries are small scale in nature and involving fishing households, relatively uh, small vessels, and um, so, uh, you know, commercial fishing for local consumption. Uh, there is little or nothing to export. Uh, however, there's still an important part and component of our economy. In 2019, commercial fisheries landing in Puerto Rico uh, got a total of 1.6 million pounds and contributed with $8.2 million to our economy. Yet, uh, when discussing the uh, Magnuson-Steven Act uh, and policies to support our domestic fisheries, fishing industries, I fear uh, we sometimes tend to focus on larger commercial fishing operations and forget about the needs of our small-scale fishermen, such as those in Puerto Rico, and therefore, and therefore uh, I take this opportunity to respectfully urge uh, NOAA to explore initiatives uh, that will help address these unique needs of small scale fisheries, and I'm talking about Puerto Rico, US Virgin Islands, um, and including the capabilities building uh, efforts that will improve data collection. Uh, data collection is one of the uh, uh, worst areas and, and opportunities to enhance uh, economic well being. I will also be asking for the record that our witnesses share any observations or recommendations they may have uh, on how uh, the Magnuson uh, Stephen Act could be improved uh, to reflect in response to the small scale fisheries such as those in the US Caribbean. I got opportunity to interact uh, with the director uh, when we were in, in recess. And one of the issues that uh, we were discussing, one it was the recovery process in, in the, in the um, hurricanes. And um, this law, the Magnuson Stevens Act, has worked quite well in the US Caribbean, uh, Puerto Rico, and the US Virgin Islands. Uh, the law provided for a regional council, uh, the Caribbean Fishery Management Council and uh, the necessary authorities and flexibilities to sustainability, sustainably manage our fisheries while balancing both environmental, environmental and local economy needs. However, our fisheries in the U.S. Caribbean are still considered that, that are poor, uh, which creates challenge for stock uh, assessments uh, to determine overfishing limits, annual catch limits, and the status of local fisheries as well. Uh, this situation is further complicated when considering that our commercial uh, fisheries in Puerto Rico are, for the most part, small scale or traditional in nature. Um, and they may lack the necessary tools to, uh, or the capacity to support all these new data requirements. So I do have concerns about the requirements of new data when we already are considered in Caribbean data poor. And in base of, uh, on my conversation with stakeholders, there is clear need for dedicated funding to improve data collection in fisheries in Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands, as well as for additional scientific research um, and studies to better inform the management decisions in the U.S. Caribbean. So my, my first question to you, ma'am, uh, will be, um, as Congress considers legislation to reauthorize this bill, what additional resources or flexibilities should be included there uh, to improve regional data uh, collection system and addressing long-standing fishery data gaps, uh, such as the ones we do have in the U.S. Caribbean. Thank you for your uh, comments and that question, um, and for the opportunity to, to uh, chat about the unique characteristics of Puerto Rico in your area. Uh, so, Yes, you mentioned that it is the fisheries there are data poor in that we really don't have that census data of 
counting the fish that come in um, the way we do in many other parts of the nation. The president's budget did call for additional funding. Of course, the FY22 budget's not uh, enacted yet. It did call for additional funding um, for the Caribbean. And I think part of the additional needs we talked about in regard to uh, more climate science and more data um, apply even more so to your area where we're not seeing the big um, white ships doing the stock assessments and we're really uh, struggling to get quality information. So there's a couple, I, I do think it would be interesting to talk about whether for data poor fisheries, the standards could be more flexible um, because it's very difficult to put the management plans together to the same standards when you don't have that quality data. So first, I would like to work with you to get more data in your waters, um, but I also do understand the particular challenges associated with meeting uh, rigorous standards when you are lacking that data. Thank you. I know my, my time expired. I want to, I just would love to introduce to the record a letter from the Sea Grant Puerto Rico and uh, Caribbean Fishery Management Council uh, for the U.S. Caribbean, uh, both uh, for the record, and I do have uh, still more questions that I will submit for the record as well, and an open invitation uh, for you to visit the island. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank and you. without objection, that will be entered into the record, and for members who have expressed concern about better data and Science, uh, I'll just note that we may have a chance in the days ahead to vote on that. There's $500 million in the Build Back Better Act for stock assessments and science. So I'm gonna tempt Don Young to continue his bipartisan ways. Uh, <laughs> uh, so the chair now recognizes uh, Garrett Graves of Louisiana. And uh, if you are watching at home, uh, unless you're operating heavy equipment, there's a, a drinking game where every time he says the words red snapper, you have to take a drink. Not a water either. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, thank you for being here, Administrator. Appreciate you. Appreciate you being here. Um, uh, first question on the on the forage bill, uh, Congresswoman Dingle's bill. Uh, as I understand, the bill uh, goes. Uh, to great lengths to make it clear that shrimp are not subject to the restrictions in the legislation. And I just wanted to uh, make sure that was your understanding as well, that, that shrimp were not actually subject to, to, to the bill. Thank you for your question. So the bill leaves it up to NOAA or the secretary under the terms, the language in the bill to create a definition of forage fish. And then it lists a number of criteria and to be straight with you, those criteria would lead to including shrimp in a definition or a category of forage fish, but, that, but the bill hasn't been enacted, the definition hasn't been completed, and I can't say definitively, but those criteria that are listed would lend towards including shrimp. Sure, uh, so, so Administrator, uh, one, it, it was my understanding that, that there were great lengths that, that they went to to exclude shrimp. And so I would appreciate if y'all could provide technical assistance to help us tweak the bill to ensure that that's the case. I, I, I want to be really clear on this, that uh, the, the objective of this legislation is something that I absolutely support. Um, but, but the health of the shrimp stock is not anything that anyone I've ever known has been worried about. Um, and we're concerned that coming in and applying some management structure there to something that has absolutely uh, healthy, abundant stocks uh, could, be, could be a problem, and especially uh, my home state where we, we actually produce more shrimp than anywhere else than in the United States, including significantly more than Alaska. They hadn't figured out how to catch them there yet. Um, so that's right, that's right, you heard that. Uh, so um, let's see, uh, second one, I'm, I'm curious, I know your backgrounds in, in the state of Rhode Island. Uh, we, we've had issues where um, some of the science that's been developed by the states has actually been more robust, more thorough than that of, uh, of the federal government. Can you just talk about your perspective on how to ensure that we're getting the best science incorporated into our natural resource management regimes? Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, so uh, um, definitely uh, after the 10 years I spent leading the Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management, um, very aware of and proud of the scientific caliber of the people that work at the state level. So for our fishery management plans, 
state information and academic information and research are, are welcomed. And you know, there are sometimes um, issues where just kind of coordinating state research or state management with federal research and federal management takes some effort. But I think we have a wonderful partnership with the states and welcome state information, which is you know, sometimes more fine grained. Administrator, I mean, is it fair to say you, you want to use the best science no matter where it came from? I know where you're going. Yes, I do. It doesn't count if she says it. Um, OK, um, thank you. I, I, I appreciate it. Um, and, and so I just. Uh, I want to let you know, we, we've made huge investments, including the, the fishers in Louisiana deciding to increase their own fees to make sure that we have better science uh, because we want to sustainably manage the fisheries and had strong concerns over the, the lack of accuracy of what the feds had produced. And you may be familiar with the Great Red Snapper Count that came out that was federally funded, that came out and really, uh, I think, demonstrated how poor the quality was of the, of the federal science on this, and, and, and this was a much more robust uh, species-specific analysis that, uh, that determined, again, triple uh, the count of, of uh, the, the red snapper uh, species in the Gulf of Mexico as compared to what the feds were managing under, which, which look, as you know, you got to manage this as a system, so you have that many more predatory fish, then it impacts your entire management regime. We need the best science, no matter where it comes from. And, and I just, I, I hope you can give us a commitment that you're going to work to ensure that the best science is used, not convenient science. Just an amen or something would be great. Thumbs up. I think, um, yes, we want to use the best science, the All Great right. Red I'll, Snapper I'll, Count. I'll, uh, I'll take that. Don't, don't, okay. don't, don't mess it up. <laughs> don't mess it up beyond there. Last question I have for you. I appreciate in your testimony you make mention of um, fishery disasters. Um, and uh, I'm from South Louisiana. We, we uh, have had more than our share. Uh, but I'll also tell you, it is infuriating to be in a situation where it takes one year to collect the data to determine if there's a fishery failure. Um, one year. Um, th these are communities, as you know, on the tip of the spear in regard to these hurricanes. They don't have that kind of time. And you make some constructive comments about the flaws. Excuse me, I didn't mean to refer to your bill as flawed. Um, Constructive improvements to the bill that that that, uh, and and I and I just want to know if you could expand on that briefly uh, about fisheries disasters Thank getting you. time yes. assistance. So out. I I agree with the chair and with you that the time that it takes to get the funding out is um, inconsistent with what we think of when we are trying to help people after a disaster. So I really want to work on that that and I'm working on it internally and with you. Um, I'm concerned that additional requirements or um, expansions or talking about um, only looking at the good years, not the kind of fluctuation of the biomass or the fisheries could further complicate things. So I think there's some issues that I'd like to discuss further, but the goals of increasing um, the pace at which we get that funding out, um, we share. I appreciate you raising your objections to the chairman's bill and yield back. <laughs> I didn't hear any objection to the disaster relief improvements in our bill, uh, but uh, the, the chair will now recognize Ms. Radawagon for five minutes. Talo Falaba, good afternoon. I want to thank you, Chairman Huffman and Ranking Member Don Young for holding this hearing today. I also want to thank House Dean Don Young for all of his hard work on fisheries management. Administrator Coit, thank you for testifying today. I really appreciated your testimony. Is NOAA in favor of changing National Standard 9 on bycatch to remove the phrase to the extent practicable under H.R. 4690? Or does the agency believe the councils are doing an adequate job of minimizing bycatch and bycatch mortality? Thank you for that question. So as mentioned, we want to do more to reduce bycatch. And we have made great strides, but I think that everyone is aligned in wanting to further reduce any discards. Um, they all count, so to speak. Um, so they all count against the quota. Um, the opportunity to kind of, uh, so and, and all fisheries have some degree of bycatch. So I think the opportunity to be thoughtful and balance interests 
and make sure that we continue to work towards reducing bycatch is the goal. Um, I, as mentioned, I have some concerns about removing the practicability language. Thank you. And uh, for my second question, Administrator Coit, there are nearly a dozen pages of HR 4690 devoted to harassment and assault prevention, far more than is devoted to stock assessments, cooperative research, data collection, or electronic monitoring. Can you please tell us how common these incidents are inside your agency and the councils in order to warrant such a disproportionate focus of national fisheries legislation? I will have to get back to you on that issue of the frequency. I can say that we have a zero tolerance policy and that um, particularly when there's observers or at sea monitors, we wanna make sure that they're safe. And we do a lot of training and a lot of follow up, um, but it has been a problem. And I think making sure that the staff who are federally funded and the, the people that are out in the, uh, at sea uh, are protected is really important. Thank you for your response. I yield back the balance of my time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Radawagen. Um, before we uh, excuse the second panel, let me just make sure that Mr. Fulcher, who was with us a moment ago, is not still online. And if, if he has questions, we'll allow him to ask them now. And it looks like Mr. Fulcher's not with us. So, um, Mr. Gorelnik, Ms. Coit, thanks so much uh, for your patience, and we thank you for your testimony. And that concludes this panel. We'll now transition to the third and final panel of expert witnesses. Again, let me remind witnesses that under our committee rules, uh, they should limit their oral statements to five minutes. Obviously, the entire written statement will appear in our hearing record. And when you begin, the lights uh, on the witness table will turn green, or the timer if you're joining us remotely. At four minutes, the light turns yellow, and your time expires when the light uh, becomes red and we'll ask you to wrap up at that point. Uh, I'll allow the entire panel to finish their testimony before bringing it back to the members for questions. So our, our next panel will begin with Ms. Mary Peltola, Executive Director of the Cuscusquim, sorry, Don Young is correcting me, Cuscusquim uh, River Intertribal Fish Commission. So the chair now recognizes uh, Ms. Peltola to testify for five minutes. Mr. Chair, committee members, thank you. My name is Mary Peltola. I'm the executive director of the Cuscoquim River Intertribal Fish Commission. And thank My you for the delicious salmon uh, that you gave us. We were all enjoying it up here, by the way. <laughs> My Yupik name is Agasuk. I've been fishing on the Cuscoquim River in our traditional way with my family since I was six years old. Our way of life as Alaska Native people is inextricably linked with our marine ecosystem, which forms the foundation for our culture, our spirituality, our food security, and our future. We have stewarded this place for millennia. In more recent years, the Bering Sea has also become host to huge commercial fisheries for pollock, crab, halibut, cod, and numerous other species. These commercial fisheries are among the largest in the world, harvesting vast amounts of seafood from the Bering Sea year after year. Even in this rich and productive ecosystem, our current system of fishery management under the Magnuson-Stevens Act is failing. Ecologically, the Bering Sea is undergoing declines at an alarming level. In 2021, decades-long trends of declining Chinook salmon stocks continued, and fisheries throughout Western Alaska were closed. Alarmingly, this year and last year, chum salmon stocks, which usually provide a critical source of food even when Chinook stocks are low, crashed as well throughout Western Alaska. These alarming changes reveal the weakness of our current management system to adapt to the challenges of climate change when the only actions are to react and reduce the directed fisheries for these species without addressing the underlying bycatch, habitat, forage, and associated issues. Alaska Native people are the original stewards of this place and have no seat at the table in a system that is set up to prioritize economic benefits over indigenous ways of life and gives primary management responsibility to those with only a financial interest in the fisheries. 
Regarding climate change, it is clear that our current fishery management system, which operates in a single species context, based on historical data and reliant on limited sources of knowledge, is not up for the challenge of climate change. HR 4690 will incorporate climate considerations throughout the management process and will provide important direction to the councils to consider and assess the climate change impacts on fisheries. Most importantly, these considerations must translate into action to ensure resilient and sustainable fisheries and fishing communities into the future. Regarding tribes and traditional knowledge, traditional knowledge has an important place in our fishery management system, yet currently there is no recognition or inclusion of traditional knowledge in federal marine fishery systems. The topic of traditional knowledge is too detailed to provide comment in a five minute window, but I'm ready to answer questions about it if asked. This bill makes several important changes, this, the HR 4690, makes several important changes to improve equity in the fishery management process overall and for tribes in particular. The bill includes subsistence, just even the word subsistence throughout the act, bringing this important use of fisheries, really our most historic use of the fishery, formally into the Magnuson-Stevens Act. Most importantly, HR 4690 adds two designated tribal seats to the North Pacific Fishery Management Council and would give Alaska Native tribes long overdue seats at the management table. In addition, HR 4690 makes important changes to provide more balance in the council system by requiring broader representation and more balanced appointments. These are essential changes to a broken system and we support them wholeheartedly. Regarding reducing bycatch, wasting is not acceptable according to our cultural values which guide us to take only what we need and use everything we take and wasting fish and wildlife has serious impacts on the future of our resources. Under current law, bycatch must be minimized under National Standard 9, but only to the extent practicable. In a council system dominated by the fishing industry, in real terms, this is interpreted to mean that bycatch need only be minimized to the extent that it doesn't cause economic impacts to the fishery catching the bycatch. This creates serious conservation concerns by unnecessarily wasting fish. It also poses stark equity issues by prioritizing bycatch fisheries over traditional and historic fisheries that allow people to feed our own families. HR 4690 addresses this critical issue by removing the phrase to the extent practicable from National Standard 9. We support this very important change, which will reorient the MSA towards the original purpose of reducing bycatch. This change is key to the sustainability of our fisheries and to creating a more just and equitable system. Thank you for the opportunity to provide comments today. Our fishery management system and our fisheries are at a crossroads as we face the crisis of climate change with, with an inequitable system of management. We are heartened by the forward-thinking solutions presented in the Sustaining America's Fisheries for the Future Act, which will give us the tools we need to restore abundant oceans and continue practicing our way of life. We look forward to working with the subcommittee and your staff to move HR 4690 forward. I have 37, or I'm over? No, or, you're, uh, okay. you are over time, but uh, I'm, I ate some of your time at the beginning thanking you for the salmon, so uh, it's good. Okay, I, I just wanted to mention that we are only trying to feed our own families. We're down to 20% of what we historically harvested we do not contribute anything to the gross domestic product or ex vessel value. We're just trying to feed our families. Thank you very much, Thank Ms. Bertol. And, and I will have some questions for you when we come back to questions as well. So at this point, I want to recognize Representative Case to introduce our next witness. Okay, Mr. Isla, are you on there? Are you with us? Yes, can you hear me? Ah, we can. Okay, let me introduce you, Bill. So I'm really honored to introduce William Isla Jr. Who, Jr., who currently serves as chair of the Hawaiian Homes Commission, which is responsible for administration of our Federal Hawaiian Homes Commission Act. And prior to his role, uh, Chair Isla served as the chair of our state's Department of Land and Natural Resources, whose duties include the management of Hawaii's fishing resources. And in that capacity, he did serve as a member of the Western Pacific Fisheries Management Council and as its interim chair. 
He has also served as the chair of the Papahanaumokuakea Reserve Advisory Council, which preceded our world-class Marine National Monument, was a member of the Pelagic Advisory Subpanel to the Western Pacific Fisheries Management Council, and helped found the Hawaiian Fishermen's Foundation. He's also a lifelong Native Hawaiian fisherman, and so he has practiced indigenous sustainable fishing practices for his entire life. He's got a wealth of knowledge in this area, and I welcome uh, you to the committee, uh, Chair Isla. Thank you, Mr. Isla. You're recognized you for five much. minutes. Thank you very, very much, uh, Representative Pompman, uh, Chair, and Mahalo for that really warm introduction. I also, you know, I fish with my my wife and my children for more than the past 30 years. And as Chair Case indicated, um, I've done commercial fishing, fisheries, recreational fisheries, and fished for cultural reasons. The um, bulk of my testimony is, is going to be relative to HR 4690 and to the Western Pacific Fisheries Management Council, because that's what I'm familiar with. Um, in addition to my written testimony, I'd like to highlight a number of points. So point number one, the current and past councils have certainly been heavily weighted to um, longline fishing and commercial fishing. Um, an example of the result of that is the way that the lobster fishery uh, was allowed to um, continue even though species were mixed. And um, so the, the spiny lobster fishery was fished, the catch per unit effort declined, the fishery turned to a slipper lobster fishery, but the panel and the scientific committee allowed the um, data to be collected the same. Um, and as a result, the lobster fishery crashed for all species. Section 305 will take care of that. Um, there is a definite conflict of interest with regards to the commercial uh, fishing influence. A prime example of this would be there were quotas that were adopted several years ago around the uh, archipelago of Hawaii, and those quotas were uh, bypassed by allowing the purchase of quotas uh, from fisheries in other parts of the Pacific. So allowing fish to continue to be taken in an area where the quotas were set up for from other areas is a great example of how not to manage a pelagic fishery. And again, section 304, and Section 305, as amended, would take care of that. Um, there is a definite lack of NOAA oversight. Uh, it's clear from the uh, OIG report 22-004-A. Um, the details, I encourage you to uh, look up. Again, amendments to Section 306 will help take care of that. I, can, I wish I had more time to talk about the shark finning um, issues and how Westpac um, had managed to hold off any improvements to reducing bycatch of shark fins. Um, and it took Congress to pass a law uh, to bypass that. I would like to bring into the record, and I'm not sure how, but I will uh, make sure that you get a copy of a February 21, 2021 um, testimony to the fisheries uh, listening uh, tour that was that you um, Representative Huff conducted here in Hawaii and the now chair of the Department of Land and Natural Resources, Suzanne Case, included many examples of how uh, the Western Pacific Fisheries Management Council um, and their actions are interfering with, with fisheries that are in state waters. Um, for example, there is a fish called akule, which is a big eye scad. All of it is captured in state waters. However, um, Westpac continues to uh, do stock assessments, um, all without consultation uh, with the state of Hawaii. Uh, again, amendments to section 304, 305, and 306 uh, will take care of that. Uh, I would just point out that as a member of the RAC, um, I am appointed by the governor. And uh, this is not RAC testimony, but the governor of Hawaii, Governor Ige, is certainly uh, fully supportive of accountability um, in in all uh, state things and especially in fisheries. In fact, uh, the current 30 by 30 that President Biden is uh, promoting uh, was actually enacted in the state of Hawaii uh, two years ago. Uh, in closing, uh, because I don't want to take up too much time, 
I would just say, with regards to the fisheries Western Pacific Fisheries Management Council, if all you do is um, adopt the amendments in Section 304, 305, and 306, uh, that will increase accountability and it will promote sustainable fisheries um, here in Hawaii and throughout the entire Pacific. And I thank you for the opportunity to present testimony. Thank you, uh, Mr. Isla. Next, we'll hear from Dr. Willie Goldsmith, Executive Director of the American Saltwater Guides Association. The chair recognizes Dr. Goldsmith to testify for five minutes. Chair Huffman, Ranking Member Young, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to provide views on H.R. 4690, the Sustaining America's Fisheries for the Future Act. My name is Willie Goldsmith, and I am the Executive Director of the American Saltwater Guides Association. I hold a PhD in fishery science, have extensive experience in collaborative recreational fisheries research, and am an avid recreational angler myself. The American Saltwater Guides Association represents fishing guides, small fishing related businesses, and conservation minded anglers who believe that long term fishery and ecosystem health are the core foundation of a strong recreational fishing economy. As a resource first, not sector first group, we recognize that effective management of all users is paramount to success and the recreational sector is no exception. For many of the most coveted recreational species, such as bluefish, black sea bass, and dolphin fish, the recreational sector is responsible for the dominant share of harvest. Effective fisheries management, therefore, must include effective management of and accountability for recreational anglers. The Magnuson-Stevens Act is the cornerstone of effective marine fisheries stewardship in the United States. The law's emphasis on implementing science-based catch limits mandating accountability across sectors, and requiring prompt rebuilding have led to significant successes. However, our fisheries continue to experience pressing challenges that the law in its current form does not adequately address. I am grateful to Chair Huffman and Congressman Case for their efforts to engage diverse stakeholders through a nationwide listening tour in order to better understand some of the most urgent challenges facing our nation's fisheries. H.R. 4690 includes numerous provisions to strengthen our federal fisheries management framework. Today, I will speak to three particularly vital elements of the bill that will help promote long-term fishery health. Improving recreational data, protecting forage fish, and bolstering fishery resilience under changing ocean conditions. H.R. 4690 makes critical strides toward improving catch data from the recreational sector. Such information is valuable not only for ensuring recreational accountability, but also for providing the highest quality data for input into stock assessments. The Federal Marine Recreational Information Program is the primary tool for assessing recreational catch and effort at annual and regional scales, but as numerous additional recreational data collection programs continue to be developed, it is imperative that these diverse sources of information are held to the same high standard. H.R. 4690's establishment of federal guidelines and a strategic plan to improve recreational data are invaluable steps toward maximizing accuracy and precision on a national scale while recognizing the specific data collection challenges and needs associated with various fisheries and regions. In the meantime, managers should advance a precautionary approach that accounts for the ongoing recreational data uncertainties and limitations to minimize the risk of overfishing. Species targeted in commercial and recreational fisheries depend on healthy marine ecosystems to thrive. Robust populations and widespread abundance of the forage fish on which many predators rely is a key ingredient to fishery success and can lead to spectacular sites such as the arrival of bluefin tuna defeated on immense schools of Manhattan in the shadow of New York City this past fall. Establishing a national framework for conserving these species is sorely needed. H.R. 4690, along with H.R. 5770, the Forage Fish Conservation Act, would accomplish this goal through requiring managers to consider the needs of predators in setting forage fish catch limits and prohibiting the development of new fisheries for as yet unmanaged forage species prior to evaluating whether management is needed. Changing ocean conditions are significantly altering the marine environment as we know it, and fishery stakeholders are acutely observing the impacts of a warming ocean. The most readily visible consequences to fishermen and managers alike are shifting stocks, which represent a significant management challenge as species move across the jurisdictional boundaries of regional councils. A less evident but even more challenging impact is that of climate change on fisheries productivity, the ability of species to successfully feed, grow, and reproduce. H.R. 4690 makes crucial progress toward implementing climate impacts into management, 
directing resources toward pressing research needs, and providing a framework to ensure that management authority aligns with where on the coast a fishery occurs. Ultimately, the best insurance policy against the often uncertain impacts of climate change is a precautionary approach to management that promptly addresses overfishing and aggressively acts to rebuild stocks. By requiring councils to end overfishing immediately, improving oversight of rebuilding progress, and strengthening conservation provisions in the event of a failed rebuilding plan, H.R. 4690 positions our nation's fisheries to be resilient to climate impacts and provide long-term benefits to fishermen and the nation as a whole. Thank you for the opportunity to share my thoughts, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Goldsmith. Uh, we'll now hear from Mr. Shannon Carroll, Associate Director of Public Policy at Trident Seafoods. The chair recognizes Mr. Carroll for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Shannon Carroll, speaking on behalf of Trident Seafoods. Uh, I'm proud to have spent the past seven years working in the North Pacific Council process where science, transparency, and good governance are primary drivers of policy actions. Uh, but before I go into my testimony, I do want to correct something that was said on the record during the last pan panel that was categorically false from my perspective, and that is that Trident and others in the Bering Sea Pollock Fleet are exceeding their bycatch limits of salmon and halibut. Uh, the document that was added to the record does not support this statement and, among other inaccuracies, conflates uh, several fisheries and regions into one. The Bering Sea Pollock fishery operates under a hard cap implemented by the National Marine Fishery Service, and the agency closes the fishery when the bycatch limits are reached. We would be shut down before exceeding any limit. I will note that Chinook uh, bycatch in the Bering Sea Pollock fishery has been reduced by 89% when compared this year's numbers to its peak in 2007, that every vessel in the pollock fishery is required to have 100 to 200 percent observer coverage, and that the scientific evidence today does not uh, point to bycatch as a driving factor in lower salmon productivity across Alaska. And I will certainly be responding with a, a, a written response to, to further flesh out those points. Uh, moving on, though, I, I do want to acknowledge and express appreciation for the work of Congressman Young, who is not only instrumental in framing what I view as one of the most successful conservation statutes ever written, the Magnuson-Stevens Act or Young Studs Act. He has been a constant champion for Alaska and our nation's seafood industry since the passage of that legislation 45 years ago. I also want to acknowledge the, the recent passing of Trident's founder, Chuck Bundrant, and note that the values upon which he founded our company, community partnership, stewardship, and a genuine desire to forge a sustainable Alaska seafood industry are still at the very core of every decision we make, we make today. We are heavily invested in the long-term sustainability of marine resources and ecosystems. The successful management framework created by the Magnuson Act is precisely why we have the confidence in investing hundreds of millions of dollars over the next several years in projects that modernize our aging, aging infrastructure and achieve better utilization, environmental performance, and jobs for the next generation. My testimony certainly includes, uh, my written testimony includes more than I can go into here. So I would like to focus my remarks today on, on one primary point. And that is that the regional stakeholder driven framework of the Magnuson Act has been a remarkable success and any reauthorization, reauthorization bill should first and foremost do no harm to that structure. Since 1976, Congress has set clear priorities through the national standards framework, empowering the eight regional councils to utilize their local expertise to balance the national standards in ways that account for unique regional conditions. And this regional approach is one of the centerpieces of the Magnuson Act's enduring success. Uh, that success is easy to quantify. Each year, over 2.2 million tons of metric tons of ground fish, uh, one third of the wild commercial harvest in the U.S., are harvested in the North Pacific, and that supports fishery-dependent harvesters and communities, and provides affordable protein to consumers across the United States. Equally important, over the past four decades, not a single Alaska ground fish stock has been overfished or subject to overfishing. The Magnuson Act has not only empowered fishery managers to sustainably manage individual species, it has also given regional councils the flexibility to implement ecosystem-based management measures, adapt to changing environmental conditions, and minimize bycatch. In my written testimony, I detail several of the management measures that the North Pacific Council has undertaken to adapt to climate change, protect habitat, and minimize bycatch. I highlight these actions not only to demonstrate what is possible under the current law, but to also note the fact that those actions involve the transparent public process with many opportunities for stakeholder engagement. Again, this is a fundamental feature of the Magnuson Act. 
And it, it's here that my primary concern with HR 4690 exists. Rather than empower the councils, the proposed legislation uh, contains mandates that will undermine the regional council framework. Many of the proposed changes will create extreme uncertainty, produce unfunded mandates, increase potential for litigation, and divert highly limited resources. From my perspective, this means the bill's passage would be worse than keeping the status quo. The core elements of successful fisheries management, surveys, monitoring, data collection, and research are in constant jeopardy due to decreasing or stagnant funding. Implications of losing funding for this work include uncertainty in annual catch limits, more conservative quotas, less tax revenue in coastal communities, decreased food security, and fewer data and tools to understand ecosystem and climate interactions. And I, I will be honest, you know, we still have work to do with respect to improving fishery performance, adapting to rapidly changing environmental conditions, and improving stakeholder engagement and inclusivity. Uh, but it's, it's profoundly important to ensure that any new requirements don't come at the expense of the work at hand or other measures that have made the Magnuson Act so successful. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carroll. And, and let me just say the document I entered into the record is pretty hard hitting. It takes Trident to task and a number of things. So if you do have different information or want to offer a point by point rebuttal to that, I would welcome that. I'm sure the committee would welcome that. And if you want to provide that to us uh, supplementally in writing, that would be uh, fantastic. So next we'll hear uh, from Mr. John uh, Papalardo, CEO of Cape Cod Commercial Fishermen's Alliance Incorporated. Chair now recognizes Mr. Papalardo to testify for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Huffman, Ranking Member Young, and members of the subcommittee. My name is John Papalardo, and I'm the CEO of the Cape Cod Commercial Fishermen's Alliance. The Fishermen's Alliance is composed of small boat, conservation minded commercial fishermen. We have nearly 100 fishing members with thousands of community supporters, and this year we're celebrating our 30th anniversary. I've also had the privilege of serving on the New England Fishery Management Council for 15 years, five of which I chaired. The Fishermen's Alliance is also a founding member of the Fishing Communities Coalition, an association of community-based small boat commercial fishing organizations representing more than 1,000 fishermen from Maine to Alaska. FCC members share a strong commitment to the sound conservation and sustainable management of America's fishery resources, and we work to ensure healthy, thriving oceans for future generations of commercial fishermen. As such, the FCC is proud to have worked with this subcommittee, both on reauthorizing MSA, as well as a recent enactment of the Young Fishermen's Development Act, which created a critical program for future generations of fishermen. I'd like to provide comment on two uh, of the titles in HR 4690 with the time I have left. I'll start with Title I, Climate Ready Fisheries. Title I, Climate Ready Fisheries includes several important provisions aimed at improving the management of our fisheries in the face of ever increasing challenges brought on by climate change. The Fishermen's Alliance and FCC support, the increasing, support increasing the adaptive capacity of fisheries management, incorporating climate science into fisheries research and strengthening the resiliency of fish stocks to climate change impacts as proposed in the bill. And while Title I focuses on increasing resiliency and mitigating the consequences of climate change, it does not include a directive for the councils to evaluate the impacts of climate change and how they manage their fisheries. This is why I recommend that the subcommittee consider adding a new climate change national standard in Section 301 of the MSA for fishery conservation and management. The national standards represent the core policy of this nation and provide direction to the agency and councils as to how conservation and management measures must be developed. A new climate change national standard would require councils to consider the impacts of climate on proposed conservation and management measures. In my written testimony, I've included a draft straw man of that national standard. I also included some language that I think would be helpful to add to the requirements of the SSC under Section 302. Moving on to Title IV of HR 4690. Section 409, entitled Offshore Wind Collaboration, caught my eye. It requires the Secretary of Commerce and the Secretary of Interior to enter an, into an agreement to fund additional SOC assessments related to the development of offshore wind energy. 
Over the next two decades, our marine ecosystem in the Northeast will be altered by the construction of a dozen or more offshore wind farms. It's my sincere hope that Section 409 will create a substantial fund capable of modernizing marine resource surveys and ecosystem assessments. The Northeast region needs a reimagined fishery survey and assessment program. A new survey program using industry vessels is also an important consideration. Presently today, areas the council has designated as essential fish habitat are being leased by BOEM for wind farms. Our lucrative and historic fishing grounds will be altered or lost, and the fishing industry and council has little to no standing with BOEM, with the BOEM process beyond a consultation and comment period. So, so you see section 409 needs to lead to better collaboration between interior and commerce. Section 502 of uh, HR 4690 attempts to address negative impacts of offshore development and activities on EFH by requiring federal agencies to consult with the Secretary of Commerce. While this section might improve the current situation, until the Secretary and NOAA are given veto power over proposed federal projects that, that could destroy our EFH, nothing will materially change. Offshore wind development along the eastern seaboard is going to have a significant impact on our industry and the habitat and fishing grounds we work to protect. It should be noted that impacts of wind farms extend beyond the respective lease areas. With each new wind farm built, it's not created in a vacuum, and yet there's a distinct lack of consideration or evaluation of the cumulative impacts with each successive wind farm built. Fishing operations that are displaced from lease areas will move to overlap with other fisheries. Habitats will be altered. When all these lease areas are built out, what will these impacts be to our historic industry? The agreement struck in 409 between Interior and Commerce could be written with total build out of all lease areas in mind. Leaseholders could be bound to fund this agreement on an ongoing basis. The annual fishery resource surveys should be industry based and in partnership with NOAA. I thank you for the opportunity to provide these comments and would be happy to provide any other information. Thank you, Mr. Papillardo. Uh, we'll next hear from Dr. Sean Powers at the University of South Alabama School of Marina and Environmental Science and the Dauphin Island Sea Lab. The chair recognizes Dr. Powers for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Hoffman, ranking member and Dean of the House Congressman Young, and members of the subcommittee. I am pleased to uh, appear for you in front of you today to discuss improving the nation's marine fisheries management. Since its enactment, the Magnuson-Stevenson Act has advanced management of marine fisheries, which in turn has benefited our nation greatly. Bipartisan legislation has provided a roadmap of confronting many of the challenges in fisheries management, from removing unregulated international fishing fleets from our coastal waters, ending overfishing of many stocks, as well as addressing pressing economic and environmental issues that could jeopardize the future sustainability of marine fisheries. Through major amendments, the act has evolved into include greater participation of regional stakeholders uh, managed in management actions and greater reliance on science-based management advice. Two points that illustrate this is the act's mandates for the identification and protection of essential fish habitats and greater incorporation of ecosystem-based principles. These were two truly forward-looking concepts when they were included in the legislation. In its current form, I believe the Act provides a framework to meet current as well as most of the future challenges through its focus on regional-based management, science-based decisions, and its de desire to achieve optimal yields and fisheries. I encourage the Act's continued attention in promoting more regionally-focused management and believe Congress should consider expanding this focus to more local entities at the state or multi-state commission level. Provided movement of juvenile and adult fish is relatively small, in other words, these are not highly migratory species, greater ability of the states to manage the stock should be considered. I believe the current shift in management of reef fish in the northern Gulf of Mexico provides an excellent example of how beneficial such a system can be, provided stocks are not in an overfished condition. I believe this is in keeping with the intent of the act to better engage regional stakeholders and achieve optimal yield. Another critical element of the act is its reliance on science. 
An increasingly important tool for fisheries managers is the greater ability of fisheries and dependent data. These are scientifically directed surveys and studies that can provide critical biological information that can be used to better inform assessments and management. Unlike fisheries dependent data, largely catch and landings data, which are currently the primary source of information for stock assessment, fisheries independent data is not confounded by fishermen behavior and market forces. And inferences are not limited to the current hot spot of exploitation. The recently completed Great Red Snap account in the Gulf of Mexico, an initiative funded through congressional action, as well as work my group has been conducting in Alabama coastal waters for the last decades, have demonstrated how fisheries independent scientific studies can be used to estimate absolute abundance of fish stock. I believe agencies agency should be strongly encouraged to provide greater weight to abundance estimates based on rigorously collected fisheries independent data. Such studies coupled with the inclusion of better socioeconomic data, which is also desperately needed in fisheries management, will help the nation reach the optimal yield targets set forth in the Act and National Standard Guidelines. Many states like Alabama have invested significant final financial resources in providing these data. Improved socioeconomic data will also allow for a greater balance between stakeholder needs and rebuilding schedules of fish population. Rebuilding a fish population is fairly easy and involves largely eliminating fishing-related mortality. Saving the fishermen while rebuilding a fish population is the difficult part of why we need further investment in fishery research. This task will become even more complex as true ecosystem-based management is adopted and socioeconomic data streams are improved. True ecosystem-based management should involve more than just setting limits of the most vulnerable species or the stock in the poorest condition. Optimal yield in a multi-species or ecosystem context may require trade-offs that may involve longer rebuilding periods for one species in order to allow optimal yield to be achieved in other fisheries. This will require greater flexibility in the context of National Standard Guideline 1. Thank you for your time, and I'm happy to answer any questions later. Thank you very much. And finally, we will hear from Ms. Meredith Moore, Director of Fish Conservation Pro of the Fish Conservation Program at the Ocean Conservancy. Welcome. You're recognized for five minutes. Good afternoon, Chairman Huffman, Ranking Member Young, and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today about the critical challenges facing U.S. fisheries and the need to make targeted improvements to support sustainable fishing under the Magnuson-Stevens Fishery Conservation and Management Act. I'm Meredith Moore, the director of the Fish Conservation Program at Ocean Conservancy, a nonprofit organization that develops evidence-based solutions for a healthy ocean and the communities that depend on it. For decades, fishermen, scientists, managers, tribes, and conservation organizations have worked together to successfully implement science-based, sustainable, and accountable fishery management under the requirements of the law. Now, serious challenges like climate change are eroding the successes we've had and threatening the future of fishing. We must adapt our management system to ensure healthy fisheries exist for generations to come. H.R. 4690, the Sustaining America's Fisheries for the Futures Act accomplishes that task by offering necessary updates to the law that build on the strengths of our current system. Provisions in this bill would tackle the impacts of climate change, improve ecosystem health, support the sustained participation of fishing communities, improve fishery data, and move us towards a more just and equitable fishery management system. First, H.R. 4690 offers a comprehensive vision for climate-ready fisheries management. Climate change is already disrupting our fisheries. Fish populations are shifting, becoming less productive, and more vulnerable to heat waves and other disasters. But even as our ocean and fisheries are being reshaped, our management system is largely operating along the same well-worn tracks. A climate-ready fisheries management system will better predict, plan for, and adapt to these climate changes in order to support sustainable fishing. 
In order to better respond to current impacts, HR 4690 instructs managers and scientists to use the best information and tools available now to consider climate impacts in their management decisions and to focus on those stocks most vulnerable to climate change. But the bill also paves the way to the future by ramping up production of climate and fishery science and by fostering the development of new approaches that can help managers make more informed and adaptive decisions. Fundamentally, we must reduce greenhouse gas emissions to head off the most severe impacts of climate change. But the adaptation actions in HR 4690 are critically important to help fish populations, marine ecosystems, and fishing communities withstand the disruptions that are already locked in. Second, this bill reaffirms our country's commitment to ending overfishing and rebuilding fish stocks. While the existing law contains clear requirements to rebuild stocks that are overfished, in practice, many rebuilding plans have failed. HR 4690 makes important changes to improve the likelihood that existing rebuilding plans stay on track and are successful the first time. And in cases where they fail to rebuild the stock, a better plan is put in place next time. Third, HR 4690 includes improvements to modernize our fishery information systems and to better use electronic technologies. It also directly addresses the need to improve the data systems that keep private recreational anglers accountable to catch limits. The bill establishes a dedicated program within NOAA Fisheries to improve recreational fishing data and management. It also recognizes the growing challenge of using data from a suite of new recreational fishing surveys. A failure to address these issues through the council process has allowed the private recreational sector of the red snapper fishery in the Gulf of Mexico to exceed its quota year after year. Fourth, this bill strengthens how we manage our impacts on marine ecosystems, like improving the management of forage fish and essential fish habitats. The legislation includes critical changes to better account for and reduce bycatch, including addressing conservation and equity issues by removing the practicability standard. And finally, as this bill moves through the legislative process, Ocean Conservancy urges the committee to support important requests from Alaska natives and tribes for the inclusion of subsistence throughout the act and the addition of two designated seats on the North Pacific Fishery Management Council. In closing, I appreciate the thoughtful effort undertaken by Chairman Huffman, his staff, and this committee to solicit feedback from stakeholders while developing this bill. That process has produced this forward-looking legislation that would create a more sustainable, resilient, and equitable fishery management system. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and I look forward to working with the committee and each of you to improve fisheries in the United States. Thank you very much, Ms. Moore. That concludes the, the witness testimony. We'll bring it back to the members for questions. And uh, Ranking Member Young has another commitment, so we're gonna go out of order and uh, yield to him for the first uh, questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And Meredith, I'll say one thing. If I hadn't passed my bill, you wouldn't be sitting there. I remember that back in 1976. Um, I wanna ask uh, Mary Patola, um, you want two members on the council, and yet you support his bill. And under his bill, the council loses their authority to manage the fish. It goes to the Secretary of uh, Commerce. Um, what good is two members of the council? Although there be a native, what, what will that help you if you don't have the authority to be, make uh, decisions on the council? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and thank you, Congressman Young, for um, you know, creating the bill to begin with. Um, on the North Pacific Fishery Management Council, at least, and that's the only body that I have experience, um, you know, among the eight councils that this legislation has, there is complete deference to the Alaska Department of Fish and Game, to the Commissioner of Fish and Game. So even, and, and I'm not sure that House Bill or HR 4690 does give complete authority to the Secretary of Commerce, but even if it were to, it would be a better system than the one Alaska Natives are in, under at the current moment. We went before the um, North Pacific Fishery Management Council in October and asked, even as, as a bottom level um, request, asking for an Alaska Native to be on their advisory panel or their scientific and statistical committee, 
they wouldn't even consider it. On their own advisory panels, um, there is a movement in the Department of Fish and Game, in my opinion, because of a lack of recognition of tribes, a complete, um, I wanna say the word poo-poo, but I, don't, I know that's not right, um, minimization of the situation that we're in, we're, we're now down to 20% of our historical subsistence harvest, 20% for Chinook salmon and 0% for chum salmon. And there's still a movement for erasure and complete assimilation. I don't think that the, Depart the Secretary of Commerce would be as anti-tribe as the Department of Fish and Game is at this time. And I just was curious because I want the count. This is a difference between chairman and myself. I believe that the councils can actually manage the fish better than a centralized political figure. That's a matter of opinion. And uh, but if you, I support the idea of two members. I told you that today in my office. For Miss Chairman, this young lady campaigned for me when she was three months old, um, and uh, I've always cherished that. Her mother was very active in my campaign. I thought you were against child labor. <laughs> <laughs> no, labor hadn't come till six months later. But anyway, uh, Mr. Carroll, uh, I appreciate your comments. Satan Triton is a great company in the state of Alaska. Um, where you have a difference of opinion with the chairman and the reports that come out, I do recognize that there's been great progress in the bycatch. We still have too much. And I'd like suggestions from your great company and maybe how we can lower that because you're constantly said it's the trawlers, it's the trawlers, it's the trawlers. And I remember when you were catching a huge amount of fish that shouldn't have been caught and you've really, I think about 89% decrease in that amount. And I, I'm just telling you this, Mr. Mr. Carroll, that I get all the information you can, factual, to the committee so we can compare notes and see you know, who's right and who's wrong. Because there are two different opinions here. I actually think there's, you can do better, I've said that before, but you've come a long ways from the way you were before. So I do, I, I thank all the witnesses, and I do have to leave, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Hopefully we can get together and write a bill. Um, that's very, very important. Uh, if we don't write a bill that, you know, you gotta give me a little bit, uh, or it's not gonna go anywhere, that's it. We're gonna work it out, <laughs> Congressman Young, and uh, I'm gonna uh, talk with you a little further about this perception that the, the council is not managing the fish under this bill. We think they definitely are, but. Well, see, that's where we yeah. work it out. If We're gonna work it out. To make sure they've gotta have the say, not the Secretary of Commerce. Yeah. Because I might be the Secretary, then where we Really? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you. <laughs> I thank the gentleman. Uh, the chair now recognizes Mr. Case for five minutes. I think all you have to do is figure out a way to make him the Secretary of Commerce and everything will be cool. <laughs> okay. Well, you um, gotta get him confirmed by the Senate though, and he's got a lot of baggage. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Chair Isla, are you still on? I think you are. Um, thank yes. you, thank you so much for your uh, testimony, uh, Chair Isla. Um, and your written testimony is very compelling and I appreciate uh, the, the concise uh, responses on the bill itself, which we're, we're trying to get trying to get this worked out in the language itself. We, I think we understand the concepts, but we need to get it right in, this, in the legislation. Um, so there has been, for a long time, a prohibition uh, on lobbying and uh, political influence exertion uh, under the OMB regulations and the, and the bird, you know, the bird rules. Um, um, clearly, I think your testimony and your personal experience is that Westpac was lobbying and exerting political influence. Is that correct? For many years, yes. Right. I mean, and they've done it across the board. I mean, they've done it, you know, in the in the in the congressional delegation perspective. They've done it certainly um, inside the Department of Commerce. They've done it uh, with the president and the administration itself in terms of the designation or the expansion or 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 what or what they want to do, which is to open up the monuments to to fishing again and to Re really reduce the monuments. I mean, they they did in your in your view and experience directly try to influence those decisions. Correct. They have also tried to influence the governor in not um, incorporating state waters into the monuments. Um, several governors, so and, and the state legislature. Okay, and we are obviously trying to uh, fix that in our in our language. I mean, we are taking the OMB. Uh, regulations and trying to statutorily implement them in this context and expand them to make sure that we cover, you know, things like um, 
perceived ambiguities, at least on their part, as to the presidential designations. So, you know, that all is understood, I think, and it's crystal clear that they were, in fact, acting in derogation, I believe, of the regulations. But I want to get to a point that you made, which is that um, you, you said that NOAA oversight had been lacking. Now, was it obvious to everybody um, in, in your time on the council and afterwards that, in fact, uh, the council was uh, lobbying and was exerting uh, uh, political influence? And, and if, if that was the case, then it's one thing for them to do it, but it's another thing to ask ourselves the question, uh, where was Noah in all of this? Yes, uh, and in fact, if you look at the, the language in Magnuson, uh, the, the fishery councils are advisory to Noah. They do recommend um, fisheries management plans and fisheries regulations, but Noah is the ultimate um, adopter of these of these fisheries management plans, et cetera. So for a long time, um, I think the Western Pacific Fisheries Management Council, I don't have any specific information to other councils, um, certainly acted as if they were the decision-making body and the implementer. NOAA has, has been missing in action, so to speak, for quite, quite a few years. So let me ask you this. Uh, and I asked, I think you heard that earlier testimony when I asked uh, the administrator, um, was there any, um, uh, and this was in response to the audit that you and I have just referenced, uh, have both referenced. Um, I asked her whether uh, she felt that NOAA had full statutory authorization to provide adequate oversight of, of, the, of, the, of Westpac in this case, but any fishery management council, and she said that she would review that and get back. I mean, I think the answer is that they are able to enforce their own laws, and so I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that the answer is just not so much that they don't have the statutory authority to do it, but that they haven't uh, done that. It, it, would that be your perception also, or do you have a different perception? Well, that, that has been my experience. Also, my experience has been that, um, you know, the Western Pacific Fisheries Management Council um, legal attorneys that are provided by NOAA uh, have not all, well, have in the past, I think, uh, indicated where, um, where fisheries, I think where some of the management um, proposals by Westpac have sort of skirted the law, and that's where NOAA, I think, could play a stronger role by just making sure that council uh, advice is is heeded. Okay, so I just want to be sure that I, I kind of have this straight because I, I, you know, like I said to the administrator, I don't want to miss the opportunity when we're trying to get Magnus and Stevens improved to add some authority that somehow they feel they don't have to adequately oversee those councils. The, uh, the, I think that the amendments as proposed in, H, H, in the, the current version, um, making the executive director a federal employee, thus having to fulfill all of the ethics uh, requirements, and then making council members, advisory members, and scientific and statistical committee members also be holding to following all of the uh, federal laws uh, with regards to um, lobbying, ethics, et cetera, I think that will have a major impact on future fishery decisions, okay. uh, resulting, in, resulting in better management. Okay, thanks so much, Chair Ayla, again. Back to you. I thank the gentleman, and the chair now recognizes Mr. Carl for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Governor, to all the expert witnesses. I, I know with all the distractions. Never hurts to cut the mic on, does it? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and, and I know with all the distractions going on, you feel like we're probably not listening, but trust me, we are. We have it, we have it recorded and we have it here in print, and I thank you for your time to come here and do this. Uh, during my short time on this committee, there's been a lot of talk about the best science is when it comes to managing fish. I don't think the best science necessarily lies with the federal government's old ways of doing things. If something new and better comes along, like what the Gulf states are doing, the federal government should pay attention and adapt. Dr. Powers, if I may, sir, uh, it is so good to see you on the big screen up here with us today. I think the last time I saw you, we were out on the Gulf fishing together. Thank you for being here. Uh, for those who don't know Dr. Powers, he is a constituent of mine at the University of South Alabama and, and is an expert in fish, fishing management. Dr. Powers, can you talk a little bit about the fishery data Alabama and the Gulf states 
or producing on their own, like the snapper check and the, and the great red snapper count, and why Congress in their reauthorization process may need to make uh, the term best science available more inclusive. Sure, thank you, Congressman Carl. Uh, it is, uh, and I agree that the meaning of best available data or science needs to be updated. When the act and the national standard guidelines were originally developed, there was really only one source of information. By default, it was the best. Uh, but more and more states, particularly in the Gulf, are spending significant resources on their own landings information systems and scientific fisheries independent surveys. In Alabama, for, for example, there has been a push to improve the state's ability to develop the data and science necessary to manage its own fishery. We have, you know, in my lab, we've been conducting fisheries independent surveys to estimate absolute abundance of reef fish off offshore and, and doing surveys before and after the fishing season to, to look at what's been removed from the system as a way to get at fishing mortality. The state has also invested heavily in their snapper check programs. Uh, which is uh, now been expanded to a, a lot of other reef fish. And they have a much, much higher participation rate of anglers uh, in the systems to, to encourage validation. So a lot of the MRIP program and the recreational data we have are essentially user reported, uh, especially things like discards and, and effort. Uh, the systems in Alabama and Mississippi are more census-based with, with verification that the angler has reported in and reported out and cross-validation to see that the, their biologist can actually see the catch that the fishermen have brought in. So those data sources ha have really improved the state's ability to, to manage their own resources at that level because they can respond at the spatial scale a national survey cannot. Thank, thank you, Doctor. I appreciate that, and I agree with you. <clears throat> we've got we've got to assure that NOAA incorporates the full results of the red uh, Great Red Snapper count into their next stock assessment of red snapper. It should lead uh, to bigger increases in quotas across the board, and which is a win-win for all sectors of the fishery. I appreciate my colleagues, Mr. Young's bill uh, requesting NOAA to send a report to Congress on incorporating more data and stock assessment from our states, and the NGOs uh, into fisheries management. Uh, they would also have to take a look at whether the federal survey data is really working for us. Another quick question, Dr. Powell, I'm running real short of time here. Ultimately, I would like to see Alabama be allowed to set its own recreational harvest targets on its own. Based on how the state has done uh, managing the, the quota so far, do you think Alabama could do this successfully while also protecting against overfishing? Yes, I do. I, I believe the states have really demonstrated in, in the last couple of years their ability to stay within the quota. When you look at, when you go according to the state's landing systems across, across the Gulf, the states have also invested in science and scientific surveys to, to inform their own spatially distinct management units. Uh, and, and again, I've given some caveats in my written testimony to when I think that, that a more regional-based approach is necessary. But, but essentially, if the stock isn't overfished or undergoing overfishing like Red Snapper is not doing either of those, it's in good condition now, uh, then I think there should be some more power given to the states to be more responsive to their local stakeholders. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, sir. Thank the gentleman. Uh, I'll now recognize myself for five minutes. Uh, obviously, one of the biggest changes that we're proposing in H.R. 4690 is, um, are the provisions on climate-ready fisheries. Um, back in 2006, the last time MSA was reauthorized, uh, climate change uh, was still viewed as, as something that we would face in the distant future. Uh, there were no provisions made for climate adaptation uh, in that law, and so uh, I was Pleased to hear from a number of our witnesses that they agree, uh, and certainly the stakeholders in our listening tour said this to us, 
uh, that now is the time uh, to build this into uh, our update of, of MSA. Let, let me begin by Ms. Moore, with Ms. Moore. Uh, why is it so important that we tackle this challenge of climate-ready fisheries? Thank you for the question. Um, fundamentally, climate change is reshaping our ocean ecosystems and our fisheries, um, and that means that our fishing communities are vulnerable to disruptions. Um, we may see situations where there's less available catch in the long term. Um, figuring out how to adapt to that now and plan for that is the best way that we can continue to sustain sustainable fishing, support those communities, and make sure that we are passing down to the next generation the same sorts of abundant fisheries that we um, enjoy today. Thank you. And Ms. Paltola, I'll go to you. Um, in the North Pacific, how will having two seats on the North Pacific Council help tribes uh, with the challenges that they face from climate change? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the question. I believe that allowing two tribal seats, you know, um, adding two tribal seats will allow Alaska Native people who have the longest dependence on these resources a say in management. Currently on the North Pacific Fisheries Management Council, the power rests with only people who have an economic uh, tie to the resource. And as I said in my opening uh, testimony, we do not contribute to gross domestic product. We do not contribute to ex vessel value calculations. So despite having federal, supposed federal protections under ANILCA, despite having supposed written priorities under our state constitution and within the Alaska Department of Fish and Game, there is zero priority placed on, on subsistence. And it's actually um, completely ignored because we don't have an economic stake in it, despite the fact that our economy is 100%, our actual economy, the way that we feed our families, is reliant on having healthy and abundant wild resources like salmon, halibut, mm -hmm. and other um, things that depend on the biomass getting um, to our headwaters. D did you have anything more you wanted to add on the issue of bycatch? We were discussing that uh, earlier, uh, and you know there was some discussion about whether uh, you know, it's getting dramatically better, or whether this is still a big problem, and I, I think we'd be interested in your perspective. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman. Um, just because reducing bycatch for the industry has a cost or may reduce harvest, I don't believe we can use that as an excuse any longer. On the Kuskokwim River, the Yukon River, um, in Norton Sound, on the Unalakleet River, um, there was no fishing this summer for Chinook salmon, zero. Um, our larder was allocated 0% for both um, Chinook salmon and chum because the chum also did not return. Um, and this is, you know, there's such a disparity, there's such a double standard here when this year alone the industry captured as bycatch 12,000 Chinook salmon and over 500,000 chum salmon. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, let's talk a moment about forage fish, uh, small fish that obviously play an important role in the food pyramid and ecosystems, anchovies, sardines, Manhattan, great examples, uh, large populations that tend to cycle in abundance and famously collapse under fishing pressure. And a famous example in California, of course, is uh, the collapse of the sardine fishery uh, that closed down Cannery Row in, in Monterey. Mr. Goldsmith, can you tell us a little more about forage fish and why they need special attention uh, under this legislation? Yeah, thank you for the question, Chair Huffman. I'd be happy to. Uh, forage fish, um, as you've mentioned, are a critical building block of our ecosystem, and they are responsible for supporting a lot of really valuable commercial and recreational fisheries around the country. As any fisherman knows, when you find the bait, you often find the fish. And it's just, it, you know, the, the tie there is really critical. And I think both your bill and, and Congresswoman Dingle's bill, HR 5770, uh, make some really significant strides here, both in terms of reducing annual catch limits to account for the needs of these predators, and also being more proactive in our approach to management. So not allowing a fishery to develop before we've, before we've been able to acknowledge uh, or ascertain what impact there might be and put any management in place uh, if, th if that's the case that's needed. Thank you very much. Uh, my time has expired. Uh, let me just see who's next in the batting room. Uh, Congressman Graves, are you with us uh, remotely? There he is. Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah, uh, you are recognized. 
Oh, great. Um, fantastic. I'm sorry if you can give me just a sec here. Okay. Um, hey, thank you. I just want to get my, my timer started so I can see what's going on. Um, uh, thank you all very much. Appreciate, uh, appreciate you having this hearing. Um, I want to start out, um, uh, Dr. Goldsmith, I, I um, uh, curious about your organization. We're one of the top uh, fishing destinations in, in the United States, and I, I'd never heard of your group. And I, I checked with some of our folks at home who similarly had, had not. And I, I thought that was really curious. Again, being that the Gulf was the, the, the top recreational fishing uh, destination in the, in the country. Um, I'm, I'm curious, um, if, if you were going uh, fish for some uh, Wahoo in the Gulf, what, what, what do you think you'd pull? I'm sorry. You said if I was gonna if I was gonna fish for Wahoo in the Gulf, probably a, I'd probably be yeah, high speed trolling with a 16 uh, 16 ounce or 32 ounce jet head. I would think maybe an Islander Valley with, combination. With say, say it again with a Jetta. Jet head. A jet head and 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 what else? What, what kind of weight did you have on there? 16 ounce or 32 ounces if I'm high speed trolling. And where do you think where do you think you'd go? Um, I know the midnight, midnight lump is a very famous destination in the Gulf, but I have not spent an awful lot of time fishing in that area. And, and, if, and if, you were, if you were going fish for cobia in the Gulf of Mexico right now, where, where, do, you think, where do you think you'd go and what do you think you'd, what do you think you'd fish with for that? Uh, if I were going fishing for cobia, I'd probably be focused in the uh, Virginia, North Carolina region here on the Atlantic coast. And, and like I said, if you're fishing for cobia in the Gulf, where, where do you think you'd go and what do you think you'd fish with? Uh, this time of year, I can't say for sure. I know there's a very strong run of cobia um, in the Florida Panhandle, but probably not this time of year. Yeah, probably not this time of year. Correct. Okay. All right. Um, so, Mr. Chairman, I think I think our witness just demonstrated that that his experience in in fishing and perhaps in the Gulf isn't, isn't very strong. Well, Congressman, um, I, I would, I would contend yeah, that. I, 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 I take it a little bit further. So I read all these quotes where, where y'all supposing to be a, a recreational fishing group, it, it, actually speaking against the modern fish act, which was actually bipartisan legislation designed to improve fish science, designed to improve the balance of rack and commercial fishing. And I found that fascinating. So, so then I take a step further and I look at your website and I say, okay, well, how do you, how do you even become a member of this group and how much does it cost? Well, look, you can just sign up. You don't even have to be a guide. Anybody can do it. I can do it right now. And it's free, which then makes me think, well, wait a minute. So where's the money coming from? Because it obviously costs a lot of money to have a group like that. So could you just tell me how you're funded if you don't charge membership fees? And, and if I could just sign up, not even being a guide, where, where does the money come from? Congressman, as a resource first, not sector first group, we're proud to have a lot of partners across sectors and really take a lot of pride in our ability to, to bring uh, allies across the different sectors who care about our marine fisheries together. And regarding the Modern Fish Act, I would say that one of the main contentions that our group had with that was that while we certainly recognize that not all fisheries necessarily should be subject to the exact same management measures, the one uniting fact that has been hugely successful since the last MSA reauthorization was the enactment of annual catch limits. And that was the major concern with some of the options that were put forward in the Modern Fish Act. We think that because, again, recreational fisheries and, have such a large and, impact. And so, and so when we actually have better science, for example, as, as was mentioned a little while ago, the, uh, the, the, the great red snapper count that found that the red snapper stock in the Gulf of Mexico was actually triple that uh, than, than was projected by NIMS, then you think that's better for us to use one third the stock rather than triple, which keeping in mind the entire Gulf, as we talked on the first panel, is actually a system. And so you, you, you can't even manage one species. Uh, you can't manage the system if you, if you have inaccurate information on, a, on one species that especially as dominant and predatory as, as red snapper are. So, you know, I, I'm reading a quote that y'all gave in, in talking about uh, modern fish that you said, quote, we helped strip it down to a few studies. I want to remind you, this whole committee, everybody you're looking at right now, we all worked on this. It was a bipartisan bill. Um, appreciate you bragging about stripping it down. The bill, there's nothing in there, nothing in there 
that's offensive. It's all about getting better data, better science, making sure it's all incorporated in because states like mine have actually spent more than the feds trying to make sure that we manage the species uh, uh, in, in a manner that's sustainable. And I would, I would affirm that having um, sustainable management of all sectors is really what's critical. Organizations that, that are funding you, that, that means that you're not really a, a, a fishing guide group. You're, you're, a, you're a, a facade for organizations that have an agenda. Why don't you just call yourself who you are and not come before the committee and others and pretend like you're somebody else? I think it's very disingenuous and unfortunate. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentlemen's Sir, the hundreds of guides who count us as who are proud to be our members take a lot of pride in the fact that we value having abundant and healthy fish stocks and Absolutely. recognize Chairman, that when we have time, healthy resources, we support right all now? sectors. I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. I just wondered whose time is this again? The, the gentleman's time has expired, and the chair now recognizes Ms. Radewagen for five minutes. Oh, Talofa. Thank you all for testifying today. Dr. Isla, you state in your testimony that you've worked for 33 years with the council. Given this, you must be quite familiar with the Magnuson-Stevens Act and how the council process works. Can you explain in your words what the MSA requires and how the council failed to follow that process? If you had concerns with the process, do you have examples of when you raised these concerns in writing to the council and what the council's response was to those concerns? Dr. Isla? Uh Yes, thank you so much for the question. Well, Magnuson has changed over the years. Um, so the most current, I think, version of Magnuson includes much more, um, much more of a requirement for um, fisheries management plans to consider all of the biological, social, and economic issues. It wasn't always that way. When it first started, it was more about uh, defining maximum sustainable yield and those kinds of things, which really didn't involve ecosystem management. Uh, my record for the 30 plus years at Westpac is clear. I have testified at numerous um, council meetings. Um, I would encourage you to um, take, a, take a look at the record. Uh, a good example of um, small boat fishermen like myself who sat and advised uh, Westpac on the Pelagic's advisory panel is we suggested the use of tuna circle hooks long before um, the, the council uh, adopted it because um, the council got sued in terms of the bycatch of tuna, the bycatch of um, cetaceans, uh, false killer whales, uh, other things. If the council had simply taken the advisory panel's recommendation on tuna circle hooks when it was suggested by the advisory panel, um, I would say that thousands of sea green sea turtles, leatherback turtles, um, olive ridley turtles, um, the small insular population of false killer whales around the um, main Hawaiian islands um, would not have needlessly been killed. So that's one example of um, what I believe was very cooperative uh, work, uh, giving honest, open advice from fishermen who recognize that a, a circle hook um, is less likely to be ingested and therefore increase mortality um, in, these, uh, in, the, in the bycatch of, these, uh, of this fishery, uh, the longline fishery. So, there are many, many more examples, and I would, you know, if you give me specific uh, questions, I'll be happy to respond. Mm -hmm. And what was the council's response to some of those concerns that you might be able to think of right offhand? The council what ignored our, yeah, so the council ignored our suggestions until they were sued by um, Earth Justice, and um, I believe a federal judge then required the use of tuna circle hooks as a mitigation measure. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, I yield back the balance of my time. I uh, thank the gentlelady and I wanna thank all the witnesses for their valuable testimony and the members for their questions.
Members of the committee may have some additional questions for the witnesses, and we will ask you to respond to those in writing. Under committee rule 3.0, members must submit written questions to witnesses within three business days after the hearing, and then the hearing record will be kept open for 10 business days to allow for responses. If there is no further business before the committee, seeing none, uh, we stand adjourned. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>